<laughs> that was amazing. That, oh, that was goodness. just for us. That, that was, was just for us. That was just for us. Hi. Welcome back to the Wednesday Club. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> I am caffeinating. Excellent. Oh, this is uh, seven cups for me today. This is, cup number, this is cup number two for me. Nessa, I, I have been. How many it, cups of water? Uh, probably seven. I, I try to drink like one to two cups of water for every cup. Be so hydrated. I'm I, hyper yeah. hydrated, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's like, a, if I don't, it, like, I'll get a headache w within minutes the second my brain is like, you're dehydrated. I'm like, oh, God, I I'm am. I'm just trying really hard not to ask how often you have to go to the bathroom. I'm, I'm drinking out of this Galactus it's Destroyer of Thirst cup, so. Nice. <laughs> it's, uh, it's frequent, but it's, yeah. it's worth it. I, how I've do you make it through our show? I, 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 we I, cut I, to you, and then he runs and runs yeah, back. Yeah, so. I run back. It's like, don't cut to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this, I'm, I'm terribly excited for today. We've been Same. looking forward to this episode for so long. We've been threatening to do this episode for so long. Uh huh. Today is all about the dreaded Comics Code! This is a high five, yes. I was pointing this. High five, I'm, I'll high five that. Yes! I mean, this is a weird thing to high five, but at the same time, no, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting! It's like, the best! <laughs> I love what this history, words. it's such a giant turning point. Uh huh. Uh, so what you see on the board behind you, uh, illustrated by our own Ken Lin, who's the best. The yep. best. Is the kind of thing that you cannot put in comics. As a result, the left is canceled out by the right. What <laughs> does approved by the comics code mean? Uh, the show's not approved by the, yeah, no it's not. It's, we're dirty. Really, it's really not. No. We're actually all werewolves, too. Yeah. This is pre-1971 comics code approved show. Oh boy, we're going <laughs> deep, <aren't> we? <laughs> January 1971, by the way. I'm so this flower. is the, what would that be, 50th? and Almost 50? 48? Happy I don't mathing know. year. Uh, happy, happy math year. I studied literature. to the loosening of the code that was put in place in 1954. Uh, this little stamp that you see on the board behind you that we've used as the basis of our show stamp, uh, which is actually, you can see behind me here, mm -hmm. uh, it is... Honestly, fondly remembered by comic book fans uh, because all of us grew up with it on all of our comics. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what it was. We didn't know why it was there. It just kind of meant comics. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has a very specific history. It almost destroyed comics mm -hmm. uh, and sadly messed up a bunch of people's lives. But it's a also lot of a lot of people. A really fun an, story. An, an impressive list of people. Yeah. <sighs> so. This is, this is a specifically, mostly an American comic story. It mm -hmm. is about how our industry was shaped forever, for better and worse, by one of those delightful, delightful mid-20th century moral panics. Mm -hmm. And it was a giant moral panic. It was uh, like kind of during World War II, but a lot after World War II. There was a lot of, oh, the juveniles of America are delinquents. And it's all because of TV and movies and comic books. And rock and roll hadn't quite been invented yet. Uh, yeah. So I, I, that's probably the only thing that left, like, the only reason any comic survived is that people got nice and distracted, like, a By year rock after and roll. this code went yeah. to, into effect. They're like, Elvis, look at those hips gyrating. Now oh. we, we forgot about comic books. Now it's Elvis's fault. <laughs> Uh, so pretty much as soon as comics appeared in the late 30s, there were already people worried uh, that it was going to destroy uh, the tastes and intellectual capacities uh, of the youth of today. I, I, I pulled a quote by Sterling North. Am I beating Please. you to the punch? Oh, yes, man. no, go. This is, this is everything I was what hoping. What year is this, 1940? This is 1940 in the Chicago Daily News. Mm. Uh, uh, Sterling North was a, a, a staunch literary critic of the early 20th century. And... He was the first big name to come out against comic books. He's like pre-Wortham, right? So here's his review of Superman in 1940. Badly drawn, badly written, and badly printed, a strain on the young eyes and young nervous systems. The effect of these pulp paper nightmares is that of a violent stimulant. Their hypodermic injection of sex and murder makes the child impatient with better, though quieter, stories. Unless we want a coming generation even more ferocious than the present one, <laughs> parents and teachers throughout America must band together to break the comic magazine. It took Sterling a while, North, everybody. but it happened. Yeah, because uh, that's 1940, so 15 and years, And Superman is two years old at that point. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. Also contains no sex at all. No. Uh, None at all. <laughs> None at all. Some weird, some weird underwear choices, but beyond that, let's... <laughs> Uh, so, so it's interesting. You recommended to us this wonderful book. Oh man, um, how great is this book? It's a fantastic right retelling of this period. It's the Ten Cent Plague, the Great Comic Book Scare, and How It Changed America by David. I don't know. Hodge, 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 Hodge do. Uh, he is a uh, critic for New Republic, professor of graduate school of journalism at Columbia, uh, and his author of Lush Life and Positively Forestry. Know nothing about those others, but this book, it like just the bibliography, like. <laughs> Like the the notes in the bibliography is like I was going through it, going, oh my god, I want to read every single one of these right. books. Like there's a comprehensive there's some good history books uh, here. called Seal of Approval that was written by Amy Nyberg, who's also written up the short version of the history of the Comics Code that you can find on the website of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, which is a great resource uh, for all kinds of stuff, but has a whole section including the text of the various codes and a mini summary of the history of the code. Uh, but this is a beautiful and very human telling. Like, he traces this moral panic to its contexts uh, and its many, many predecessors, of course. Mm -hmm. He gets mm -hmm. into the fact that, you know, people are constantly shocked by new art forms and constantly convinced that mm -hmm. those art forms are going to destroy children. And well, as even, we know, no children have ever survived, so mm, they were all Even, right. like, video games become a giant thing, moral panic against video games. Internet comes out, moral panic against the internet. Like, the internet's going to kill this generation. I mean, and it's it like, turns out the internet was evil, so who turns knows? Out, yeah. But there, there, like I can even remember seeing like some of that early like YouTube like uh, uh, material and thinking, oh, this is just dumb. And some of it was, but like now there's a lot of brilliance that's also come out of that. And it's like any medium when it's new is having these growth pains, and like you just have to kind of give it the space to play and to figure itself out. And before long, you get someone like Will Eisner coming along, going, oh, oh, I, I know how to do this now. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me set. Let me change this for everyone, you know, so. Uh, the, the best form of this I've ever heard is the medium is not the message. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. And that the media, no medium is, is inherently, has an inherent uh, story attached to it or, or an inherent flaw other than the, that it can only exist as the best way to tell a very particular type of story. Yeah. And there are stories that can only be told as comic books. Yeah, there really are. There are, there are yeah. stories that need, that need that very specific mixture of, picture, words, and chronology that to come together to actually tell them themselves in the best way. And there's nothing inherently wrong in that. There are certainly terrible stories that can be told that way, but there are terrible stories that can be told anyway. I could just sit here and ramble a terrible story, which yeah. I'm kind of doing. No, That's all it's right. great. You say I'm, I'm, there's like levels of subliminal right now, and I have terrible nightmares. <laughs> I, I have terrible that. nightmares about this. <laughs> I don't know why. Screenshot Hi. this and draw like a horns on Matt Key's head and him being like, I'm thinking bad things Oof. about you right now. No, inside of never. Head. Loosening up that right shoulder. To never bad there. things about Talisa. Oh, Nothing but love for Talisa. <laughs> uh, so there were the sort of garden variety, like, I don't know about this new art form. It's uh, cheap and accessible and kind of chaotic, and that's specifically a thing kids love about it and a thing that upsets me. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same mm -hmm. time, you have sort of a generation, like, the concept of the teenager was being invented at basically yeah. the same time. And you had an art form uh, really heavily identified with kids. It felt like theirs, and it was confusing to their parents. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, to be honest, you had a huge uncontrolled industry where people were writing and drawing basically whatever they whatever want. Whatever they wanted. Which is what a lot of people loved about it, but it did also mean that once somebody figured out that stories about shooting people were really popular, there were suddenly hundreds of comics mm -hmm. concerned with crime. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, and this, we, we'll bring this up because this will pay off later, but uh, so the, the early days of comic books were wildly experimental. People were trying all kinds of different things. Uh, one of the first sort of breakout hits was the first superhero in Action Comics number one, uh, Superman, Batman. as you know him. Oh. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was a fast turnaround, trends coming and going like crazy, uh, and circa 1942, uh, one of the side publishers, from our perspective, tried out a new thing. Uh, and I think I have it in there. It should say the crime does not pay 1942, if I did it right. And what you'll know... We're, we're just going to stare. We're going to yeah. stare quietly at the screen. Chief. <laughs> Chief. Uh, so here's here's one thing that I will throw out that I, I think there is we there are. we go. The the great thing about this uh, 
It's the other one. Can you, this is the 1948, um, and I should have made the file names clear, but I probably didn't. Uh, so here's, uh, while we're, uh, while Chief is, is hunting, uh, one of the things that I find- There we are. Yes. Thank you. There it is. Oh, that's solid. So this is uh, hilariously one of these, uh, crime does not pay, uh, which <laughs> is, it's not a coincidence that the word crime is huge and the we're pretending this has a moral is quite mm -hmm. small. Mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. was the first issue of that, the first magazine of its kind. There's a beautiful, in the book, they take that, that cover apart in really beautiful style as yeah. he goes through like the 50 different elements of chaotic art happening on mm -hmm. that one cover. On that one cover. Um, uh, yeah, so like uh, uh, one of the things that I find interesting is that the crime comics become huge right around the same time that the war comics start to go away because the war is over, right? Like isn't that kind of around the same time? Like the war, war comics are huge, superhero comics are huge, those things start to fade as the war ends and crime comics are like, What's up? Yeah, crime and western were two of the sort of ascendant genres yeah. at that point. I guess because because they've they been around for a couple of years a by the time. Had lots of Nazis to punch at that point. Exactly. Huh? So like it, it was kind of like there like comic books grabbed national attention because like you could you could punch Nazis through that. Like there was a, a sort of like catharsis to the medium at that time. But when that left, publishers were like, well, what else do we need catharsis for? Punching criminals. Plus, now it has a moral. Now people can't get upset. Like, now people like Sterling North can't be like, ah, you're corrupting the youth, because we're telling the youth not to shoot each other. And these are true crime stories. These are actual crime stories. They were not true crime stories. But they, but they were true crime true stories. True crime stories. Uh, uh, and they, were, they really were. Like, any time they would be approached about it, they'd be like, no, 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 we're, we're not glorifying it. We're telling kids, this doesn't pay. Look, you die most of the time. That's so real you, bad. The reason I put the second crime cover error is that the first round of really intense, uh, like, the criticism was basically there from the beginning, but mm -hmm. the first time it got really intense was circa 1948, mm -hmm. uh, when Wortham, like, gave up. Frederick Wortham, who's going to be big in this story, uh, was a short derail, I guess. He was a... There's no such thing. <laughs> a psychiatrist who... And this is an interesting one thing that I love that, about the portrait that emerges in this book is that they're fairly even handed in that, like, he was a serious practitioner of medicine who almost certainly thought he had kids' best interests at heart. Yes. Uh, but did not do a good service either to his scientific principles or to his integrity with his resulting work. Because, uh, like, in life, he was a diligent and devoted guy who wanted to help children, uh, helped mm -hmm. open. Uh, one of the first uh, psychiatric clinics available in Harlem. Well, yeah, in the Harlem first... for like impoverished uh, and uh, African American like kids. Like he was like, no, no, no. Like we need to take care of all ethnicities mm -hmm. and all poverty levels, like and and uh, uh, like wealth levels. Yeah, like... defiantly anti-racist. Yeah, uh, but got into his head that comics were causing kids to go bad. And despite never being able to actually come up with evidence of that, made an entire life out of it uh, yeah. very successfully. Yeah, and like they, they uh, sorry, you want to say something? Oh, Please no, go. no, no, I'm, I'll, I hear, I'll have, I'll have, I'll have, I'll have a moment in a second, I'll finish, or, finish, uh, finish uh, the thought. Uh, <laughs> uh, one, of, one of the things that gets pointed out by the comic book industry all throughout all of the various, like, the Senate subcommittees and all the trials and the journalists and everything else, anytime... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chief. You have way too many toys, man. <laughs> well done, sir. Well done. Uh, uh, now I've completely lost my train Worth of thought. Him. Worth them. Yes. Oh, was that uh, he didn't actually like the the um, I can't. I'm forgetting the name of the center that the one that he opened in Harlem. A lot of the studies Lafarge that or something. Lafarge. Lafarge. That's right, Lafarge. Mm. Uh, the Lafarge Clinic in Harlem was that he would cite research that he did there, but the research that he was doing there was almost exclusively like on already troubled kids and stuff like that. So like, the, it wasn't like... A common objection is that he said, I talked to some troubled kids and they said they read comics and other people point out 90% of children read comics. Mm -hmm. All of them were reading, millions of children, nearly every child was reading comics. Mm -hmm. So the presence of a bunch of troubled children who read comics like you could also come to the conclusion that oxygen is, co is causing juvenile delinquency. Yeah, exactly. He was he was pointing at the anomaly and saying, "See, this is a massive problem." And I was like, "No, no, no. This is it's an anomaly. Like this is it's causing a problem for kids who it's, are it, already 
having problems. Like, you know, like, and, and even then, the study isn't 100% certain that it's even causing problems with them. It, so. it's, it's worth pointing out also at this point in time, psychology was really in its infancy, and they were yeah. just, it was, it was I, 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 this is a really great song as well, it's just a great phrase. Frontier Psychology was, <laughs> was a, it's a very it's good, a good song. song, you should yeah. look it up. Um, but at the time, I, it, was, it was really like even the notion of like the basics of basic Freudian tenet of, of mm -hmm. analyzing, of being, of, of analyzing people and actually like, looking into the actual causes of psychosis. In other words, we're, we're very, very new. People were really making leaps and, and oftentimes very incorrect leaps. Mm -hmm. Leaps a lot of what we got from the, from the, the like, post-war to the early 60s. It was a lot of junk. Mm -hmm. um, it was a lot of, and, and we, we, we got both very positive and very negative things out of it, but there was an awful lot of this is, this is the thing that's making everybody nuts. Yeah. As opposed to we just got out of a war and we've just gone industrial, everything's, Everyone's a little yeah. kooky right well, now. Well, and that was one of the things that I kind of picked up from, the, from this book was that, like, while they're pointing at juvenile delinquency, they're completely forgetting the fact that these kids uh, were raised at a time when, like, a majority, like, a lot of them had dads overseas or even mm -hmm. maybe, like, moms, like, family members are overseas, uncles, aunts, whatever, cousins, and that's, like, they're dead or, like, they're not coming home or they're terrified, like... There are many levels you know, here, one like, of which is that it is not clear that juvenile delinquency was even rising. No. Exactly. Uh, and it is not clear what, if anything, was associated with the possibly existing rise in juvenile delinquency. But people were worried. It was just a worry time. Just a worry, worry, worry. Uh, and there was the very real, like one of the first sort of crucial generation gaps was about to come out. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was arising in the form of this specifically youth identified pop culture. And we are talking about a form with just tremendous popularity and penetration of the, the population. Uh, the, the figures, in, I kept trying to write down all the different figures for circulation, mm -hmm. but they were talking about like, 80 to 120 million comics a month being sold in yeah. the mid 40s. Yeah, well, uh, and like being sold, but then they also assumed that like a lot of those, like the kids who were buying them were then trading them with friends them. and circulating kids aren't them. Dumb. You know, <laughs> so like it like they're, they're, the projections of people who read them are double the sell numbers. Mm -hmm. they, so. They, so Everyone was reading them, everyone was sharing them, and they were changing rapidly and being mm -hmm. innovated on by a wide range of either very sincerely motivated artists or extremely eager to make money folks. Uh, and they pretty quickly they attracted uh, you know, criticism from church groups, uh, criticism from uh, civic organizations, criticism from PDAs, uh, and the kinds of people who rather than seeing them as a bridge to literacy saw them as destroying literacy. But you know, you had the same thing when, when motion pictures and talkies yep. came out. They were like, yep. they're loud, they will destroy children's abilities, like their sensitive hearing will be ruined by movies. Yeah, like technology scares people. Like I, I read somewhere one time where like, the I think it's probably just a wives tale, but like the 110, you know how it's like really windy? The highway. The Hi, there's a freeway in Los Angeles called the. the I, I may actually. The this, this is this is an area of expertise I have. Please yeah, give, I'm give, sure, give like, me the story. I, I heard a wives' tale once this. that it's curvy, not necessarily because of the terrain, but it was because it was an experiment in transportation because it's the first freeway it, built in America. Oh, uh, it was where yeah, it, was it the could. It was that. Yeah, yeah. It was the first was freeway the one, built in America. And they made it windy because they were afraid. Well, if people start going 50 to 60 miles an hour in a straight shot, they're going to 30 to 40 miles an hour. Okay. People are so, start going 30 go to 40 crazy. miles. Yeah, so there's, there's a reason 30, that 40, thing is a death trap. Yeah, 30, 40, <laughs> maybe pushing 45 50, miles an hour. People are going to start like dozing off because they're going too fast or the speed. Like, again, I don't know. I, I, I think they actually, I heard that they, on they, Radio they, Lab they, once. They, but. they still make an awful, there's, there's an occasional curve every few miles mm -hmm. just to make sure that you're awake. And then it's, there's mm -hmm. several things. But yeah, there was, that was actually, there was a lot of weird tech put into that yeah. that is just useless because that yep. freeway is a, is a death trap. It's a, oh, it's a, it, I love it driving was, on it, but it is a disaster it was, it was, waiting. It was, the, it was the first freeway ever built and it mm -hmm. definitely is a, is a nightmare. And I love that it's called the interstate. It's the I-110 and it yeah, it's, only goes from Pasadena to Long Beach. Yeah, my, my, yeah. Oh. So the first, like. I've seen Roger Rabbit. There, there were, there was a uh, negative press surrounding comics when people were paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That's true, uh, sadly. <laughs> there was negative press surrounding comics basically from the beginning. From uh, the it very would beginning. rise and fall as people got distracted with other things. Uh, but there was an especially virulent, virulent round of it, yep. uh, circa 1948, which is when Fort Wortham gave his first sort of presentation mm -hmm. on comics and juvenile delinquency, uh, which would form the basis six years later for his wildly popular book. 
Uh, Seduction of the Innocents. Mm, not a, it's a very scientific dry title, right? Right. Uh, uh, I, the, the, the more I went through this book, the more I started to kind of equate him, fairly or unfairly, I don't know. He, he seems like the 1940s version of Dr. Phil. Like, pop psychologist... Like they were all pop seem, psychologists back then. So. Sure, but like, see, like seemingly well-meaning, and like. I don't think Lafarge, I know enough about Dr. Phil to confirm or deny this. I just mean like he's like he's like we're gonna have someone on stage and we're gonna psychoanalyze him for an audience. And Mass it's just culture like, is sort of being invented at the same time yeah. that real scientific progress is happening, and he emerges as he. So he publishes articles that get uh, like it was in like I think Ladies Home Journal well, and I, then in Reader's Digest. There was uh, I actually pulled uh, a couple of them the la uh, Ladies Home Journal I think mm -hmm. and Collier's. Collier's was the big one. Oh, uh, that was the big one. That, the, was the, that was the 48 one, right? That was the 48 one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and in the Collier's one. Uh, they, Do you want to read an excerpt from that, or? I don't. I don't okay. like. I've I've we, got images. Oh, pulled. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, if we if we can read it off the screen, yeah, we can we can mm. we can do that. But um, that's uh, I think Ladies Home Journal. But that's also that also work like they've oh, got God, that's lousy, that's... filthy Altaria. Like they're giving examples down there of how these books are evil. It's a good eyeball stabbing there. That's yeah, pretty solid. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if if you can find uh, <laughs> Chief, hate to put you on the spot, but if you can find the. Um, uh, the Collier's one. I know that one's labeled Collier's. Should be in the, the drop books. Uh, but um, that was the one where they posed pictures. Yeah. They posed pictures. <laughs> like, they like, they've got a, a girl tied up in the back there. They've got, like, kids with knives and guns. And, like, they're like, this is what comics do. We've done research at the Lafarge Institute, and this is what we've discovered. And they've got comic books on the table posed. Uh, I want to know what Pluto's doing in that, in that and, scene. Yeah, like... <laughs> Yep. Uh, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Keep pushing in. But like that was the like uh, from what I remember from the book, uh, that was like the first big like that Collier's and like the Ladies Home Journal, the Reader's Digest, like forty seven, forty eight, when those articles were coming out from Wortham and his associates. That was, oh, this is a menace. That was a real the, the first real round, and that's where we get. And this was the big thing that was because I've known pieces of this story for years, but yeah. what I didn't realize, I think, was the extent to which because they eventually the Comics Code is going to be a self policing uh, body to prevent government censorship of comics. What I hadn't realized is that. They were trying to prevent federal action, but that was because they were fighting already for years tons of local and state actions, mm -hmm. like massive efforts by legislatures at mm -hmm. different levels, uh, fighting and winning and losing free speech battles all over the place uh, over the subject. And the, the 1948 like early round of panic was accompanied by the, some of the first rounds of book burnings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, the book burnings, burnings were starting as early as 48. Uh, one of my favorite things about the book was that they interviewed kids. Like, they, they had excerpts of interviews for, from kids at the time, but then some of those kids that were at the book burnings, they have interviews with later, and they yeah. were like, yeah, we actually didn't want to do that. We did it because we felt like we had to. Like, yeah, when, when all of your you parents know? and teachers are like, let's do this, it's evil, you're, mm -hmm. you know, you have only a few choices of how to yeah. respond to that. Yeah, and like some kids, uh, there was one towards the end of the book where... <laughs> This one, this one guy was giving this, this, uh, his perception of it. He said, we all thought we had to. I brought the books not even knowing that they were going to burn them. Some of those books were that my favorite. That was a later favorites. one. They called it a book swap. He yeah, was the like, book oh, swap. That's yeah. right. That's they, right. They said, give oh, us 10 man. comics and we'll give you a hardcover book. Which for a kid, you're like, free stuff. I've yeah. already read these. Good deal. And then they Good burn them. Good deal. And then they burn them. And he's like, no, no. I thought, I'm not going to get those back. I thought you wanted me to show off that I read. He won the prize for the most comics brought in. Oh. Uh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. And like they interviewed him as an adult and he's like, I hated it. I, <laughs> that's not what I wanted. I didn't sign up for that. I didn't know they were going to burn them. I love those books. Like. Now, they also talked to some kids who were sincere, who mm -hmm. were sort of like, no, we, we saw a bunch of this stuff. We thought we were doing a good thing. They, mm -hmm. like, they were selling filth at drugstores for a dime. Uh, we thought we were making a statement. Mm -hmm. Uh... But, uh, yeah, an interesting, fun time. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, that's, that attracted isolated, like, backlash criticism, that that was obviously a very fascist thing to do. And then, like, it was interesting because everyone on every side of this fight thought everyone else was fascist, mm -hmm. um, which at least we could all agree was a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, but No one wants <laughs> to be a fascist. Why would you want that? 
Uh, but because some of the critics of comics actually came at it from a, like, if you're teaching people to go outside the law and that they can trust in the inviolable morality of some kind of superhero, like, isn't that suspicious on its own? Which is hilariously a theme that would be investigated by later rabble-rousing generations of comics creators. <laughs> um, that, that's one of the most interesting things about the code, and I'm excited for us to get into the text, is that it is a mix of things which essentially we would all agree with or that we would all agree probably shouldn't go in a kid's book, mm -hmm. and then other stuff that we wildly do not agree with. Mm -hmm. And like it's, it's all over the map. Part of the problem being that at this time, because they were a new medium heavily identified with kids, mm -hmm. this discussion was almost always happening in the context of whatever you put in a comic, you are marketing it to kids, and kids are going to find and buy it. Yeah. And, and almost no attempt to say, like, you, you, we, we will see, I guess, that, that eventually someone will sort of try to say, what about older readers? But they yeah. never even get a chance to get what that What about the adults? I, I, I think that, like, maybe a, a good, like, analogy would be, like, if Teletubbies, like, if, like, 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 Teletubbies comes out and, like, parents are like, oh, this is great. And then all of a sudden they see, like, the Teletubbies, like, just stab each other. And then, like, a mutant, like like uh, werewolf Teletubby comes out and is like Argh! and it's like that's not what it that's not what it is that's not what it was intended to be but the public perception of comics was that it was Teletubbies and that's not what the writers had in mind right like is that to a certain an, extent to the, to the extent like, that right. I'm kind of excited by your Teletubbies yeah. pitch there but other only than that. some of them were really paying attention to that and then there are other folks who were sort of like eh it's not really going to do them any yeah. harm the argument was made that there was not much more violence that you could see in these than you could find in the newspaper or yeah. in the movies exactly uh, and, uh, it, and, it, and it is one of those things that is that is strangely worth noting is that there was there was violence and sexual content that existed before comic books yeah uh, and it was it was there before film and television. These yeah. things these things are not new. We were, uh, it's in the Bible. Like. We were actually. I was I was just <laughs> thinking. There's a there's a there's a uh, um, there was a great and storied history of of traveling um, traveling morality tales that mm -hmm. would often accompany uh, small carnivals or otherwise across the United States, where they would actually have someone go up and actually sort of they would act out these little. Um, I suppose the closest thing we have to them these days are like these little morality tales or morality plays where they would like show off stories from the Bible. And there usually be about 10 minutes of like nice basic stuff and then a, about 45 minutes of what is obviously an excuse for extreme sexual and violent content. <laughs> We're like very, very obviously in uh, like designs to just show this off as a, here is a story from the Bible, which is just, and boobs and violence. And, violence. Like, and it's really why everybody was there. Yeah. Uh, and, those, and those sections got longer and longer as these shows, like these shows over the decades, it was became like an hour and a half of that in ten minutes of it. I, I remember like when I was in seminary, and I'm I'm not going to remember the exact uh, chapter, uh, book, chapter, verse, but uh, the one of the more You're problematic stuff, like was in the, I think it was in the prophets, where like Yahweh demanded the Israelite army to find all the infants and bash their heads against mm -hmm. rocks, and it's like they're like the ministry students were like. Yeah, that's that's one of the ones we don't. You'd be understand amazed what you can do with puppets, handle. though, on a stage to pull that together, and like pe people pay good money for that yeah. back in like, like nineteen twenty. That's in the Bible, oh. and like that's <laughs> babies, and God said to do that, like, but like comic books. No, it's a lot of eye stabbing in comics. Sorry, did that's... I just make this controversial? No, so, no, so what's it's hilarious right. is, uh, it. and it ends up coming into this later. Uh, there is, there's tremendous debate over, because record keeping was poor and boasting was high among the first generation of comic book creators, but one of the sort of co-founders of all of comics was a guy mm. named Max Gaines. Uh, he worked at a printing company along with somebody else uh, that sort of kind of came up with one of what's considered the first comics in the form of uh, Famous Funnies, mm -hmm. which was initially reprinting comic strip art, because comic strips were sort of the earlier art form by about 40 years of popular distribution. Yeah. Uh, and then eventually Originals, uh, and then Max Gaines founded the company that would be known as EC. Uh, Educational Comics. Mm hmm And uh, among <laughs> other things, notably published Stories of the Bible. Stories of the Bible, uh, yep. Which hilariously had their first couple of covers be violent sensationalism before mm -hmm. somebody caught on and mm -hmm. went like, uh, m maybe don't put this. <laughs> maybe don't. <laughs> like, maybe. Stabbing Goliath in the heart. That's on one the... of the most easy things I've ever heard. That's oh, yeah. so pleasing. Well, uh, and, that, and that was like, that was before Bill Gaines, like his son took it over and really went that direction on purpose. Like Max Gaines was like, well, that's the story. That'll probably sell comics. Sure, let's do like, like it wasn't a problem yet. 
Uh, so oh, eventually game. we get, so 1948, we have the first round of real big scares uh, and some reaction from comics. And this is where the other crime does not pay come, cover comes in. If you can show us the older one and then switch to the newer one, uh, that would be ideal. I also I have to probably... stop and apologize to anybody who's currently listening. Where, when, if Matt's uh, Teletubbies talk activated your Siri, we do apologize. <laughs> oh my God. We are getting comments. Okay, Wait, so my... uh, <laughs> the older one you will notice, they, they try to do something about this size ratio between crime and does not pay. So we go from there to here. That's significantly better. Crime gets better. smaller, does not pay gets bigger, and now at the top it says a force for good in the community. And oh, at man. the bottom, it says uh, something good about the magazine that I can't remember right now. The magazine mm -hmm. with the widest range of appeal dedicated to the eradication of crime. So that is both meant to say, maybe we're also for mature readers, and, but we're on the straight and narrow, even if kids are buying us, we're doing the right thing. Yeah, we're doing the right thing. Uh, yeah, Charles Fif Beard. I was going to also say 52 man, pages. That's, that's pretty solid. He emerges as an interesting figure from yeah. this book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and... and I'm trying to remember, he like stole half the art and didn't pay for half of it or something like that, right? He was apparently very big into, I definitely drew this myself for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I did not trace this and this is all completely out of my own imagination. And every figure's a different size, don't ask why. Yeah, um, um uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this book is so good. I you love will, this it's, book. It's beautifully it's, written and it will make you fall in love with many of the personalities from the old days. And yeah. it, like, oh it sent God. me onto I, so many rabbit holes. Like, I want that shirt so okay. bad because okay. of We're this. Here. Because of this book, I want that shirt so bad. This shirt is available from the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. Uh, and it this will it's not coming up quite yet, but uh, this was the the most famous casualty of uh, of the the coming comic book wars was publisher Bill Gaines. Uh, but so we're in 1948, we've kind of weathered the first storm, and as a, a nice coincidence, crime comics just kind of go out of vogue and get replaced by the next big trend, which is initially makes people less suspicious, because crime was the first thing, like the religious groups were up in arms from the beginning, mm -hmm. the classical literature types were up in arms from the beginning, but the wider public didn't really get onto things until crime got really huge. Yeah. And then it was like, people shooting each other, what? Uh, <laughs> just, Perfect impression. You know, that's what they sounded like. Uh, People shooting each other, what? But because comics books were a restlessly innovative and imitative form, uh, the next big thing was coming. And the next big thing, uh, out of a little team called Simon and Kirby, uh, who had already created Captain America back when superheroes were the thing in World War II, uh, and who would go on to do many more uh, excellent things, Jack Kirby, obviously, did a couple more things after Just this. But in the there. meantime, they stopped by... It was mostly by... Stan Lee. Yeah. <laughs> In the meantime, they stopped by 1947 and uh, invented romance comics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a, a strange revelation to me. I was like, Simon and Kirby? Oh, yeah. Ro Young really? romance. Young yeah. romance. Uh, oh, yeah. Real quick, I want to throw this out. Okay. Uh, 1947 edition of the Saturday Review was the first article from Worth. Excuse me. Ah. Just get that date 100% out mm -hmm. there. The Collier's uh, uh, piece, the article was called Horror in the Nursery. Yes! How's oh that God. for a sensational title? I mean, comic book people couldn't have done it any better. No, no. <laughs> like, I would, I would read much... Horror in the Nursery. I yeah. would be it's like 12 or 300. It's, it's a and classic. Then, horror in the Nursery. Uh, uh, what are comics doing to kids? And then you have pictures of kids killing each other because of comics. Yeah, I'm Not a parent. I'm all. reading that. What are comics doing to my children? Oh, no, sir. Yeah. Yep. Totally works. Mm. So, so the crime menace abates a little bit, uh, and at first nobody notices anything particularly wrong with the new trend, except of course that like, and, and I shout out for the pre-code romance comics especially. Uh, they published, a, Craig Yo edited, I think, and, up, and cleaned up a, a whole collection of young romance comics from that line, the title of that name. Uh, and they're like, I, I honestly loved them. They, mm -hmm. they tell interesting, complicated stories. They're still 50s comics. They use a lot of the conventions of that time, but much of the art is just gorgeous. Uh, you don't count on a happy ending in these comics. Mm -hmm. They are interesting, small social stories. They're domestic dramas. They're people finding love and losing love and cheating and getting back together and trapped in bad, like, they tell socioeconomic stories about people struggling against class barriers. There's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on in these. Uh, but again, with the typical traits of comics that uh, 
thousands of people are working very quickly to make as much money as possible and express their artistic freedom. Uh, that initiates a wave of romance comics. Uh, and there are, again, no limits on, mm -hmm. on what you're putting in there. Although by our standards, we'd consider all of it tame. In 1949... Oh, yeah. So. yeah, not so much. Not so much. Yeah, and like I, I, I'm trying to remember some of the stories that they told in the in the book about some of the the comics because I didn't have a chance to go back and read those specific ones. But it was like they weren't doing anything like at all except like well, they're going and on these dates are things and where like, like our standards are very different on this mm -hmm. stuff. While we still understand that like needle to the eye is a pretty scary thing for a kid, we are no longer traumatized by the idea of somebody getting divorced or yeah. dating three boys at the same time. Very true. Uh, Very and true. they were like, that is a threat to the fabric of the society. No, and it's, and it, and it's, always, kind of it's always been a very families. uniquely Ameri American problem, which is that we are, we, are, we are irritated and concerned at the thought of, of, of 100 people dying violently, but like the possibility of someone having one breast might actually ruin. So that, that, is, yeah. that, is, just, that is just the line too you far. You crossed the line, I have, Mr. Man, I have, yeah, no, it was, especially I will say working in anime, that was always a fascinating oh, thing man. of like, of like yeah. watching censorship because we were dealing with similar censorship issues when we were beginning to bring anime to the West. And it was always fascinating going like, I think we disembowel like 15 people in this particular one, but I think there's eight seconds of a bath of a bathhouse scene in this one, and this is the one that's going to be a nightmare to bring to the United States. Oh, Lord. Uh, yeah. I, I remember that as a reader because my own standards were calibrated in a similar way where I would mm -hmm. encounter certain Japanese comics where I'd be like, this is normal, this is normal. Whoa! Whoa I'm like, in trouble. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kept reading, obviously. Oh, Rama One Half well, was, yeah, was Rama One Half was a, was a really was a fascinating fight because like yeah. every now and then they'd be like, oh, yep, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> but then Fist of the North Star was not nearly as much problem the trouble getting over to the states, even though we literally blow people up from the inside. Just just pop them. we <laughs> pop them like balloons like every four pages. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! All right, so, so turn so, number yeah, two, comic. so romance comics. So romance comics happen. Doesn't bring on as Doesn't much direct, uh, immediate backlash as the crime comics. And in the meantime, like everyone is distracted. We're in the Korean War now. People mm -hmm. are, you know, war comics are back in a different way. Uh, other trends are coming and going. Uh, and the next big thing is probably circa fifty-one. Nineteen fifty, I think. Nineteen fifty. If what you're talking about is what I think you're talking. The about. The next trend, the, the new next, trend. The, you might the next say? big thing. Mm. Uh, this is, meanwhile, uh, uh, the Bill Gaines, uh, who wanted to be a science teacher. Chemistry. Uh, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, yeah, did no, I just no, no, actually you? No, no, no. No, no. Oh, you. Okay. Chemistry is a science. We're both right. No, I know, but like I didn't. I sorry. You're checking in. It's good. Okay. It's all good. Uh, also, I do that constantly. I'm okay. training him. Um, it's so adorable. It's so uh, adorable. <laughs> you footnoted me. It's much better. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll, uh, I'll footnote I can take. <laughs> oh, come on, Chief. Thank you. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> we are friends. <laughs> Why do you do this? That is that is the best thing ever. Uh, one of the so one of the things I love about Bill Gaines <laughs> is that uh, this is sad. This is a terrible segue from what I just said. Okay. Uh, his father died. You're right. It's, it's, a, bad segue. it's, it's, it's a terrible, uh, it's a terrible, terrible segue. Uh, chief. Uh, uh, so his father uh, creates entertainment comics or edu education comics. Dies in a boating accident, and his father wishes for Bill to take over the comic book company. Bill doesn't want to do it. Bill's been studying to be a chemistry teacher. That's what he wants to do. He reluctantly takes it on. Uh, I, I believe, according to the book, he would only show up once a week. At first, to, yeah. To just sign the checks and then check out. But he had to start reading the comics and uh, like editing them. And before you knew it, he was really becoming, he was falling in love with them and starting to become invested in them and becoming invested in the artist. And then started looking around for the best artists and the best writers and insisting to pay them fair rates. And... Then word got around, and all the other great artists wanted to come work for him because he was paying fair rates. On time. On time. Uh, which, where oh, everyone man. else wasn't. Not, not a common thing. Uh, <laughs> especially then. Uh, so very quickly, he was able to generate an impressive roster of writers and artists. And it's one of these things. There is, there's a tremendous sort of... Uh, there's a, a, a martyrdom nostalgia that attaches to EC and to Bill Gaines specifically. Uh, they were never the best selling of all comics, mm -mm. Uh, but they, like, because we look at the roster of people he worked with and they're freaking titans. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's just an incredible bullpen. Uh, and because, unfortunately, they, like, got hit real hard by what's coming, uh, it, it is very easy to sort of mythologize this period of creativity that they had uh, where he was employing people like Wally Wood, mm -hmm. Jack Davis, uh, a certain Harvey Kurtzman, uh -huh. um, which I guess we haven't quite gotten there yet. But, Not uh, yet. Al uh, Feldstein. Al Feldstein, his uh, primary um, writing partner there. Uh, um, there uh, I think... Uh, Marie Severin, who's Marie, my hero. Uh, uh, Gardner, uh, Gardner... Is it Gardner Fox? Is that what I'm... He... I don't oh. know how much he did with EC. He's certainly a, an important figure I know, from well, the time. Yeah, they, they listed his name in the book uh, related to EC in some capacity, like... Like Orlando, yeah. uh, Kriegstein, Bernard Kriegstein. Uh, we, I should have brought samples of all of their art, but I didn't. Uh, I'm going to see, let's see. Uh, is it worth trying to find this easy bullpen that I was telling you about? I have a oh, picture at home that I decided God. not to bring and then sort of decided that that was silly and I should have brought um, it with me. But yeah, so like Bill Gaines, like I just like, I kind of want to see that as a movie now. Like... Because, like, what, that's Aww. such a movie. Like, it's such a starting point. There's such an arc to his story of, oh, my God, I have to do this stupid thing. <laughs> I don't want to do this thing. I mean, I guess it's kind of cool. Actually, that's pretty cool. Wait, I can do what with this? Wait, this is actually, like, a really brilliant medium, and it's new, and we can play around with a lot of different stuff. And, wait, we can do so much amazing stuff with this. Oh, my God, hold on. I'm fully invested in this, and now I want to pay every single artist all the money in the world. Now I'm going to, ah, I'm going to do all this amazing stuff. Like, it's just like, and then he ends up being the mart the ultimate martyr for, like, the comic book industry. And it's just, like, it, it, it is, it, I, like, I want to see that as a book. Like, I think, or not as a book, but as, as a like, film. Because you have film. the book. Yeah, we, we have the book. <laughs> but, like, like, to the extent that, like, he becomes, like, this sort of, like, sarcastic, uh, there's, hey, there you are. I'm here. That worked. They never even noticed until you ran in front of the yeah, camera. They never oh, noticed that shoot. you were gone until you ran in front of yeah. the camera. Our seamless illusion. Uh, <laughs> I was, I was watching Pocket it happen Gina. going, going, I, so, so this, this, uh, this, this sort of young guy ends up taking over his dad's company. Uh, he, he claims that sort of, he's like, oh, we pay more attention to the stories, but he happens to also get the best artists who yeah. are doing basically the best work. Yeah. Uh, of this time, and they they start chasing a bunch of new trends. Uh, and we have, I think, a photo of uh, the the il an illustration of the bullpen. Oh and, my, oh my God. God! There he is at the desk, oh William M. Gaines. Oh my God! Uh, the little lady with the uh, white paint is colorist Marie Severin, who is also the artist of this picture. Uh, Amazing! She, Holy cow! Her brother, uh, um, what's his face, Severin. I. Oh my God! I bet it's in here. Um, you can, yeah. It's labeled on that giant picture, but I cannot remember right I think now, I know and I feel really bad. I was about to say, I'm so I, sorry. I've got, yeah. Uh, I think I know where to, exactly where to go to. What direction? Uh, to the right. Damn it! It's J P Severin. I can't remember what it stands for. Um, but we've got Johnny Craig in the upper right, who is a horror and other kinds of things artist, doing a private eye story here. Reed Crandall up there. We've got Lyle Stewart, the business manager, uh, instructing Marie as she's putting this picture oh, together. Oh, um, you'll remember Lyle Stewart from much of the book. He yeah. stayed up all night writing that uh, partially successful testimony. <laughs> uh, Bill Gaines partially. looking probably more relaxed than he ever was in life. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Bernard Krigstein, who is notable for his skill in fine art, as uh, noted in this picture here. Joe Orlando, who did a bunch of the most wonderful science fiction stories, including one that we will hear about later. Uh, oh, look at him up there. Oh. <laughs> uh, Dick Smith, who is reading Girls, Girls, Girls. Uh, several of the, the receptionists from that time, uh, Nancy Siegel and Gloria Orlando. Uh, we've got down there uh, Evans, I can't remember his first name, Jack Davis, one of the all-time great artists, a certain Harvey Kurtzman and Bill Elder, uh, who would be uh, founding titans of Mad Magazine. Jack Common, uh, Al Feldstein, editor, writer, artist, money counter, humorist, father, diaper changer, and I think that next line says, good lord. <laughs> uh, and the final two who are Wally Wood and Al Williamson. Yeah. This is, I Look have a giant one. framed God, one of these at home because that it is, makes me so that's happy. That's amazing. Beautiful picture. But it was a 
hell of a room, essentially. Yeah, like that was the bullpen that you wanted to be a part of at that time. And what a great, yeah. what a great image Good of shot. Wood too. Good that shot. Was well yeah. Well done. Uh, well done. So, and, and and I don't know, like, they weren't the biggest at the time, but they were doing some really interesting work. Mm -hmm. And they also uh, stumbled into the next big, like, right when everyone was taking their attention off comics, they were like, mm -hmm. you know what would be a great idea? Horror comics. Yay! How can that possibly go wrong? Uh, <laughs> and, and, and again, from the book, uh, I think it's from uh, Al Feldstein. I think it's Al Feldstein who came up with the idea or pitched this the was, games? This or? was a story that I did not know until I read the book, mm -hmm. but apparently there is some controversy, and this is going to happen anytime you're getting stories from 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, two different people at EC may have invented the horror comic in close succession, only one of whom got credit. Mm -hmm. uh, that being Al Feldstein, Bill Gaines' best friend. Uh, he, he may not have meant to sign the deal with the other guy and then mm -hmm. leave it in a drawer and pretend he invented it later with Al Feldstein. He might have just been confused. <laughs> Who but knows? Uh, anyway, it um, went. But yeah, the, the horror comics become the thing. Like, that's the next big trend. There were no ho horror comics until they did them. Uh, there were a handful. But Handfuls there was a, here and there, yeah. but not to the degree that they were doing them. And the second they became, and I think they were, they were just like little bitty stories in the back of, like they, weren't they like? They Are you like, thinking of the way that they transitioned that one title to avoid having to pay a postal fee? Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Maybe I'm getting it a little confused. There was one of their crime titles that they, I think, I think it was a crime title, that they slowly transitioned over to, uh, like, in, over the course the of three issues and, so that nobody yeah. would notice. And uh, this I didn't know. One of the reasons all the books kept changing titles but keeping the numbering, I thought it was because, you know, you already had an established audience. It was because you had to pay $100 to register a new title with the post office. Uh-huh. Yep. So why do that when you can just be like, last issue was Crime Patrol, this time's Vault of Horror. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> comics. Sometimes the shortest answer turns out to be the right one. <laughs> it's uh, hundred bucks cheaper. Money. That's, yeah, yeah. hundred yeah, bucks cheaper. But yeah, kids at home, if you have heard of Tales from the Crypt. This is where it came this from. This is where it comes from. God, I was such a huge Tales from the Crypt fan. I'm still a huge Tales from the Crypt fan. I was not. I had horror, horror in me did not mix as a child. I love it now, but... Oh, there were there were a couple yeah. issues of that that gave me. I had a. I. I it was one of my earliest comic book memories was getting an, a hardcover archive of classic tales from the crypt stories, oh. and a few of those gave me the worst nightmare. Oh <laughs> yeah, just, just just horrifying. <laughs> oh. So would you say that they damaged children? No, I mean. Do you think we should maybe set the country on fire? I think that, I, I, I'm of the opinion that that I am probably a poor poor judge of that because depending on who you are, I could be a good outcome or a bad outcome for that. <laughs> So I, I, I re fine think outcome. I respect that there are definitely people who look at me and go like that is not what I want for my child and I I, I can I can respect that, but yeah I'm I, I'm but of the opinion. You are a prime example of the fact that let's say you do raise a subversive child is that a bad thing? Oh yeah no it's mm -hmm. this is it's what makes the internet happen. Please. <laughs> internet wouldn't internet wouldn't happen without without subversive children. This is what we do. So the new trend, which was the name of the line of mm -hmm. successful oh, magazines man. that Bill Gaines uh, put, mm -hmm. started at EC, uh, Vault of Horror. Vault of Horror. Uh, Tales from the Crypt. Something uh, with terror in the name. Tale, yeah. I want to say Tales of Down. Oh, Hunt God. of Fear. Uh, Hunt of Fear. Anyone that was you one, can think yeah. of. Uh, any Vault, yeah, Vault of Horror is the one I own a names. few copies. Like there's a few that I own a few copies of. Nice. Are, I like pretty this, covers. I like pretty covers. This. This Put book made wall. me fall in love with EC and everything that they like. I like. I can't wait to go to WonderCon and just go to oh, every man, single booth get... looking for EC comics now. Aww. Like I'm so excited to like. It'll be easier to find the '80s reprints or some of the other. Probably I so, but I, 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 I will hit Rocket. But... We'll find some stuff. It'll be good. <laughs> yeah, I, I really want to see if I can find some some relatively cheap. Uh, so. Oh, I know that piece. Oh. But, which one? He's given head. What are we looking at? No, I'm just, yeah, oh, I'm just, just reminding. I've seen that. I'm just before. looking through the pictures this to see if there's brilliant. any. This is brilliant. I think I forgot to yeah. load that one in. But, uh, yeah. uh, oh, yeah. I, I, I didn't do it because I was like, oh, Amy will do it. <laughs> I was like, Amy's got that one. So I, I don't want to take over. Because we do. We, we, we should. Fa there's so much story to this story, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and a, quick, a couple quick questions from, yeah. the, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the. What other books would you recommend other than Ten Cent Plague to, to mm. catch up on the story? Seal of Approval from Amy Nyberg. Uh, Tencent Plague, you had another one you recommended. There's a, there's a book that I'm reading right now. Uh, uh, I'm not a big fan of the title because it's a little sexist to me. It's of comics and men. We're used to it. It's uh, I know, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> That's a three I'm on the now scale. Like getting, I'm now getting used to not being used to it. Oh, I, yeah. I haven't been used to He's it. He's been I've, working so I've hard. I've been used to it, and now I'm like, 
But wait, that's enraging. Uh, <laughs> um, so I love you. Uh, I love you. Yeah. Um, but it's it's a great. It, it was originally written uh, by a French author, and it's been recently translated. And it's the full history of comics all the way to the 2000s. Brilliant. Um, and they he covered for about 20 or 30 pages mm -hmm. the, the comics code stuff too. And he actually has an interesting theory that I'm I don't know if I'm on board with or not. I need to do. But you're a little, only partway through the book, so you won't know. I'm only partway through the book. Yeah. Uh, but his theory is that uh, the comics code. Uh, may have almost killed the comics industry, but their adaptation to the comics code is what gave birth to the modern superhero. Oh, that's 100% well, the case. I, yeah. I would, so, I would there would be that. no Silver Age. Without like, the comics code. Without the Because comics that was code. the answer, right? Like, it was the answer to the code of like, well, we can't do horror. We can't do crime. I mean, I guess we can go back to the capes, but no kids are going to, I guess let's try it. It was two years between the code and uh, what is considered the first Silver Age comic, yep. the new Flash. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 not to derail any further, but another another interesting question that came through the chat is: do you, if you if the code had never happened, do you think that comic books would have the popularity that they do today, or would they be more or less popular? It's so tough to imagine. The best I can imagine is either how they how they exist in Europe, where they're where they're a popular underground art form, or Japan, where it is ubiquitous, but but. And and they go everywhere, but it's it's it, it's there's there's something about the sig the singular superhero that is really such a force of of energy that it's hard to imagine. I I, I, I do think that like without the code, we don't have superhero comics. Like we have superhero comics, but just not the, to the degree that we have them now. I I think that we would have continued like exploring different genres, like would have gone from horror to monsters to, to sci-fi, back to romance, then cowboys again. And, I think like, superheroes you know, like, would have stayed juvenile. I think it would have been like the, yeah, Sentai, the Sentai stories of Japan. Where we it certainly would wouldn't have an industry dominated by one particular genre. No. Yeah. Madness. Um, which yeah. is insane. Uh, yeah. uh, but this is a fantastic question that we should return to. Yeah, no, uh, just want to put that out there. But I am curious, let's see, so... So comic books are stretching boundaries. Uh, the artists are stretching boundaries. Hey. Uh, <laughs> By the way, the audiobook is fantastic. Who does it? Uh, I mean, I, I got it through Audible. I can't remember who awesome. reads it, but um, the who's, guy who reads it, in? the guy who reads it has a very deep voice. But like, he puts like inflections throughout. Like when, it, like it, it, like it's it's a fantastic read. It's it's, nice. it's currently like, on hold on iTunes for reasons that I can't understand. But oh, it's, interesting. But, like, I, yeah, I, yeah, think I, it's I, on, it's on I know. I, I know. I I got it through Audible last year and immediately fell in love with it. It's, it's, man, it's fantastic. It is funny, I was commenting to you before we went on the air that this is one of my favorite subjects, but this particular account of it does make it tough because I love it as like, it's a piece of historical trivia and this book will really make you think about the lives it ruined. And yeah, that's less it, fun. It's way, yeah, like just just on that <laughs> oh, topic, I, 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 have the, I have the list. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm, well, just, just for context, this is the, uh, the, one of the very first appendices here among the artists, writers, and others who never worked in comics after the purge of the 50s were 15 pages of names. Yeah, Talison is scrolling through them right now. Yep. They some just of these folks go. passed away, some mysteriously, some just tragically, but a lot of them just yeah, walked away or got forced it out. Just goes and goes. Some, some, uh, like some tried to write like under like pseudonyms or draw under pseudonyms, but... Like there's like stories of like one guy went and became like a police dispatcher and another guy became a delivery man and it's just like they were, it's you work so a, a generation hard. of pop artists that yeah. were just decimated by like like we just a we, ton we of took whom were women apparently yeah yeah we, I, the list kind of shocked me even even like I professionally scraped for names of women and things was I was. You shot. Yeah, we, we, uh, we, we lost a generation of pop artists. I mean, yeah. like it's truly terrifying. Yeah, and it, it, it's like it's it's just like on a on a on a deep level as as someone who's trying to get their name out there as a writer and and comic and stuff and like the stuff that I get for to get to do for Geek and Sundry and everything. But like, you work hard and you pursue this art form that you love and that you can empty yourself into and put your creativity into. A few and of them also thought it was a dumb paycheck, but like. Sure, but like a lot of them really like. Like, they were artists. Uh, they were artists, and they were writers, and they enjoyed it, and they didn't want to leave. Like you know, there were a few stories of artists who were like, "I didn't want to leave. Like I really loved what I got to do." And it's always fun to read. Like, and they missed it for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And it's so, like, oh. Oh I've, God. I've, I've I've never met a lot of people who just did this for a paycheck. Like that's the other thing is like I know like the notion. I've met a few who are like it's the but like 
There are easy, there are, oh my so God, there are easier ways to make money. It is yeah. interesting though, because what you have at the, in the first generation of comic book creators, you oh. get folks. Uh, he did Ender's Game, that's cool. What, that's awesome. Uh, in the first generation of comics, you get a lot of folks who will tell you that they did it for the paycheck because nobody thought it was an art form yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of them actually did incredible work, but were conditioned because they were depression babies. Yeah. They, like, there were great stories of like, yeah, I was started working when I was 10. Yeah. Like, I dropped some art on that guy's desk and, and it was, and I was off was to the like races. Will Eisner was like drawing by what, like 15? Oh, a bunch of them were sort of to, like, my dad, this the happened family? and the family like... needs me to work. I'm dropping out of school yeah. and I'm drawing comic books. Like, so there were actually a ton of people who would have volunteered the information that they were doing it for the paycheck, but a lot of them were also dedicated artists or people who loved art and like... Well, and the other, the other side of that is that it was so demonized at the time. I think that they still have like, like, like some like relative version of like PTSD where it's like, oh no, no, I was just for the paycheck though. We didn't like, take it seriously. It's like, no, 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 it's 2018, dude. Like it's, if you loved it, it's cool. Like yeah. we love you for that now. Like th this isn't 60 years ago where we're gonna demonize you. This is yeah, but we for, for anybody you, who but... knew a de depression baby growing up, I mean, like you know, my great grandmother was keeping twist ties in a plastic bag. No, exactly. The day she fucking died. Exactly, I exactly. Mean, my whatever happened the ruined them. Yeah. like it really broke them. Yeah. But oh, anyway. I, I was at a, a <sighs> eating a, like a family dinner with my grandma at some point when like the the 2008 recession was in the relatively like. Mm -hmm. The, the, the real bad stages, and something came up, and somebody, like at a family event, mm. offhandedly compared it to the depression. And I've never seen a woman sort of be like, basically, she was just like, no, you don't no, get to say nope, that. Yep. You have no idea. Nope. I had never seen that. And I was just nope. like, yeah, okay, okay. noted. Okay, uh, <laughs> don't, don't, don't mess with grandma. Um, Good so, to know. Uh, it's the early 50s. Rock and roll hasn't quite been invented. We're all but swing full music of repression and, jazz. and terror. J uh, yeah, no, jazz is having its own moral panic, which is oh, yeah. which is fascinating. But and 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 the dope is it's, having and it's the not dope. Officially related to communist hunting, but there is a paranoid environment out there, and mm -hmm. everyone is worried about mm -hmm. brainwashing and. Uh, American ideals, and there's just a lot to be afraid of. I, I, yeah, I come from a deep family history of this, and we're a deep believer that every moral panic is the same moral panic. It's 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 that same energy, yep. just sort of divested. It, in, it's in a, 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 a corruptive energy. It's like My, uh, there's some corruptive energy, and they're going to take advantage of us and take over the nation. Yeah, we're not like, going to be our own. It's body of the invasion of the body snatchers. Yeah, and, and like and I have family members who are definitely victims of some of, of some of yeah. the moral panics that that yeah. have. That have uh, 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 Attacked uh, entertainment in one way or another. So we were, we are a family of. Oh no! Oh no! Ah, don't, <laughs> don't you touch my smut. This is my smut, not your smut. I worked hard for this smut, and I'm very proud of it. I God wrote part it. of this smut. I wrote this. I spent years in perfecting this smut. <laughs> I was playing for two years in New York. It did very well. Ah, <laughs> you sir can kindly leave. <laughs> so, uh, this is, <laughs> it's a long story, but yes, we are. It sounds like a wonderful story. Uh, so I, I do want to get, let's see. Please. Um, I, I'm, I'm torn on this because I want to lead up to this, but I also want to jump straight in and start reading from this and then work backwards to explain the how we got there. I think that's a, I think that's a great I, call. I, I follow your lead. I, uh, so essentially in 1950, uh -huh. Uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. The, like just as the previous panic was dying down, uh, horror comics get invented, they get wildly populated, have hundreds of imitators. Oh. Uh, and a second round of panic culminates in 1954. Uh, and I guess the, the brief, the thing that really set these off, God, there's so much background required mm -hmm. for all of this. But uh, the Senate convened a subcommittee to investigate juvenile delinquency. It was modeled in some ways after very successful subcommittees to investigate organized crime, which had been run in 1950, I want to say, two. Uh, by, Sorry. I don't know how to say Estes Kefauver. Does anyone know how to say his name? I think that might have actually been it, but. Oh, Keephopper? Keep that guy. Are you talking about the, the yes. senator who ran, yes. tried Keep to run for president? Yeah. Yes. Keephopper. 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 Wow. Keephopper. That's how they said it in the audiobook. Oh, oh, see, advantage audiobook. This is why um, audiobooks are good. Estes or Estes? Estes Keephopper. Estes Keephopper, yeah. which he's in charge of saying. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Estes Kefauver. He was a senator who really wanted to run for president, and he had made it very well known very early on that he had presidential ambitions, and he very quickly and vehemently attached himself to bringing down comics as a way to put so himself out there. So what's interesting is the there. first round of hearings, which he actually led, that had a sub-thing on comics, they basically came to the conclusion that there was no proof comics were hurting anybody, and the mm -hmm. issue died for a couple mm -hmm. of years. Mm -hmm. He was a side guy on the second set of hearings. Uh, he was on that committee, 
but like he wasn't even the guy leading that committee. But the earlier hearings were a watershed moment in American popular culture and mass media. They were one of the first widely televised governmental it was proceedings. Televised. <laughs> That like story about the hands, I had never heard. I'm sorry, this is turning into a no, book report. No, 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 go ahead, like, go ahead. I, I had I actually, never heard like, the story and I it was incredible. I actually forgot to about it. Go, tell, re, remind me of the story. So here's an, uh, just a, a side note on mass media and, and images and storytelling. So I'm going to argue that it's pertinent to our show for that reason. Uh, the first round of televised hearings with Estes Kefauver. Estes Kefauver. Sounds like Kefauv. Kefauv, but okay, Kefauver. Okay, Uh he was leading investigations into organized crime. They weren't legal proceedings, but they sort of had the feel of that because they were just, it was just people being sworn in to talk mm -hmm. to a Senate committee. And they traveled around to different cities and they were investigating organized crime. Uh, and part of that ended up being a brief diversion into comic books as they fell under interstate commerce mm -hmm. uh, and the question of crime and delinquency. Um, but mostly he was talking to, you know, gangsters in different cities. Yeah. Uh, and one of the most famous interactions, at least according to this account in here, was uh, when he was in New York leading these uh, early 50s hearings and was talking to a uh, famous gangster, Frank Costello. But Frank Costello was like, I don't want to be made a spectacle of. Don't point those cameras at me. Uh, essentially for reasons of sort of like, I'm not going to let you bully me into being this face on national television. Yeah. But the cameras, uh, the way he puts it in the book is the cameras had to show something. So they showed a tight shot of his hands. So while he was trying to argue about his legitimate businesses and make his persuasive points, we now in 2018 with a lot more visual literacy yeah. understand how badly this backfired. Because instead of seeing his face and hearing his points and being persuaded, you watched him nervously Ring fiddle with hands. pieces of paper and have oh, sweaty man. hands and be this oh. disembodied literally pair of menacing mm -hmm. sinister hands like, like can you think of any worse way that, to that, make your case that couldn't you couldn't have, have come a up with a filmmaker worse. could would choose that deliberately to make you not trust someone yeah. uh anyway so people had strong emotional memories of what this looked like uh and a few years later another round of uh of of hearings happened uh, and this time, the Senate, a different committee, which he was on, mm -hmm. uh, was investigating juvenile delinquency again and devoted a couple of days to comic books. But people were already conditioned <sighs> to see whoever was talking to these guys as bad news. Yeah. So when they bring in comic book publishers and writers and authors, well, they, if this subcommittee is looking at them, well, they must be bad. So like all the stuff that they were reading in, in the Home Journal and Collier's, uh, Reader's Digest, Saturday Morning, all of those. And this happened within a couple of weeks of the publishing <laughs> of the book-length <laughs> version of all Wortham's articles, which Sed was the book Seduction of the of Innocent, the innocent. Uh, summarizing all of his research uh, into... And he, like, alone among the credits, he really thought superheroes were a huge part of the problem, which is, uh, like, yeah. he was kind of an outlier. But like, uh, I, I have... I have. There are so many good questions here. popping up. Yeah, but sorry, yeah. guys. And uh, we will eventually need a five-minute topic, so please We will need a five-minute topic. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm also, in a few minutes, I'm going to have to vanish for, for unfortunate other reasons oh. because I'm poor, I'm bad at scheduling things. Oh, thank you for this cover. But thankfully, I, I've been, like, I've been very, I'm, like, sad I have to leave because this is actually a subject that I, I know only, oh, only, man. only, like, base, internet, like, base comic book fan knowledge of. Which <laughs> is, like, I... I, like, I fell in love. And you know what? I, I have to give kudos to you because you were the first one to really start talking about the comics code in a way that I was, like, intrigued. Mm. Like, I'd always been like, oh, it's like, I would like to know more about that. But the more you talked about it, the more I was like, I want to study the fuck out of There's, this now. And, like, I went, I, I found that book and was like, I'm just going to listen to this on, on audio. And then I listened to it twice. I was like, oh, my God, give me more. So, like, half my Audible book account now is, like, comic book history because of this. Aww. So, so. B b before before I bugger out like some terrible person, uh, 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 how do you how do you feel about Cavalier and Clay as, as sort of a fictional? Oh my I God. adore that so book. So the, 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 the chat room wants to for, know. I've been waiting for an excuse to bring that up. I love that book. For those of you who don't know, who wants to do this one? I mean, I can. No, you got take it. Yeah, take you're it, in. Please. This, you're, this is uh, this is your swamp, man. Uh, the Amazing Have Adventures of Cavalier yeah. and Clay is a work of fiction by author Michael Chabon. Chabon. Uh, Chabon. And it is about. Fake, like it's about imaginary people who just happen to be, the, who feel like they were real people. It's, it's, from it's very the Forrest Gump. Of it's like yeah, they've it's been inserted into history as like the, with their own comic book that they came yeah. up with. Like so, like there's Stan, Stan Lee is mentioned, Timely Comics, uh, uh, DC Publications. Like they they have all of those references in the book, 
but they create Joe Cavalier and Sam Clay as two, as a, as a writer and artist team who come up with a character called The Escapist, Ironically, then became a real comic book that they created later based off of this fake book from mm -hmm. the like, so that you can actually find Escapist comics. And they're very good uh, based off of a fake history yeah. that is told. And like the cult of the Golden oh, Key. Oh man, like, it's, it's so good. The book is, is incredible. It is. The book is so good. Engaging across like every single. And like, it go, like it's so funny because I, I was told that I would love it because of the Golden Age comic book history of it. And this, it, actually, I'm not going to say that part, but uh, it it goes to places that you would never think about. It's, He's also just an incredible writer. It's yeah, poetic. I, I, it's I think it's like, I think it's oh, a good so I think good. it's a good companion to this history, but I don't think it's necessarily I, I I don't think it contradicts this history in any in any you know, real I mean, way. It probably makes a perfect starting point though, because it'll give a you nice, a sense of yeah. the era if you like. It draws out the that this first generation of comic book people, especially, were almost all immigrants and children of immigrants. And mm -hmm. very uh, young. Uh, very young. Depression babies, all all of this stuff sort of comes in uh, and gets shown off in that in the course of that book. Oh, it's I know. So good. I'm I'm it very is quietly like I'm like fantastic. I love you guys. I'm so I can't wait to catch this on on while. I'm so sorry. I have to leave. I love okay, you guys buddy. so much. It's I don't okay. want to leave. I want to talk okay. about. I want to talk you. about the comics code. More. Love you. It's um, okay. Any any parting thoughts? Um, uh, nothing. I mean, like, I, other than like, it's it's it's. Uh, I mean, like nothing nothing concrete. Just because it's such a big topic. And it's always difficult. Uh, I'm, I'm always, I'm always nervous about, about, about anybody, anybody who has, who has a really strong opinion about what somebody else should be doing and putting into their brain or otherwise. You're doing this wrong. And yeah, it's, it's. I'm right. You're wrong. Or more to the point, I'm always, I'm always horrified. But every time I hear the phrase "think of the children," I always get a little bit of a tingle on the back of my neck of like, <gasps> I am, and they're uh, like, it's making my spider sense tingle. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in hindsight, it is it is much easier to look at these things and laugh at and like the speed at which and it's fascinating also I, I've found the speed at which these conversations are happening now because culture is now happening at a, at a at an accelerated rate. I remember um, during the uh, is rock and roll corruptive uh, trials when they had Frank Zappa come in to um, thoroughly humiliate Tipper Gore uh, in those in those. Uh, Early, um, in the, it's a whole nother. Speaking of a whole nother censorship, <laughs> I it was, and I thought it was exciting that I was like, I'm really excited that like this generation of of of, of what I consider what my family considers to be awful moralists get to live to see themselves become ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can go back and go into the like ancient like writings of like the, the the Roman the Roman theater critics and like they didn't live long enough to to hear themselves be stupid. Mm -hmm. And I'm like. It's fascinating that we're just now, and like I remember in the 90s going, we're at that cusp now where like someone gets to be like, I cannot believe I tried to have a Senate committee over George Michael's Faith album. <laughs> oh. <laughs> really? Really? I'm like, I'm like, I can just like, and like no negativity to Tipper Gore, bless her heart, I'm sure she tried. But like, it is, it is definitely like, I can't imagine there just comes a point in, in her life where she's like, oh God, I made that a thing. Oh, but, by the way, oh. on that note, uh, and now, now we're at like almost a cycle of ten years where like I'm like, oh god, ten years ago I was like, what was I against? Oh man, I don't even know what I was thinking. Uh, <laughs> as as a parting gift, yes. Wortham eventually kind of relented. I didn't. I have noticed that he published in a lot of other places later, mm -hmm. but I did not look that much into the later life. Did he relent? Oh, he well, really I mean, like you guys, I know we're getting ahead of each other, everybody, because I, I have to leave. I saw a letter from him in a fanzine once and went, what? And yeah, meant to look into it and never did. Uh, uh, let me. I, I made a note of it here. Um, very, very few moralists ever apologize, but I definitely yeah. get the sense that some of them eventually realize that they were being a little silly. <laughs> so, which is all you can ask for. Um, Maybe we all think we're a little silly. So this is uh, 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 just like some uh, some rough notes that I, I, I found online. Uh, in 1966, he published a book called uh, uh, "A Sign for Cain: An Exploration in Human Violence," hmm. uh, where. He compared Superman to Lee Harvey Oswald during an era when the comic book oh. Superman was at its most endearingly silly and absurd. Uh, but then, in 1973, he published The World of Fanzines, a special form of communication. And uh, uh, this one, uh, I, I need a, uh, let's see, Dwight Decker in Frederick Wortham, Anti-Comics Crusader, who turned advocate. Uh, a book that was published uh, back in what was that? Holy cow! 1987. Yeah, I did a lot. Um, Dude, 
uh, key, the, 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 my new show is. Oh, is man, my whole, I was going to say my romance. Yeah, my ro I'm going to bring it for romance comics, man. It's going to uh, be rough. Uh, uh, so in this book, they describe this book as, uh, this book described World of Fanzines as a love letter to comics fandom, praising the efforts of comic book readers and presenting our internal hobby publications as the very model of nonviolent communication by bright young people. Oh my God! And he made no reference to seduction uh, in Little that book. Little late guy. But uh, he, he uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's a little uh, late. Destroyed an industry by himself, essentially. But uh, he had a lot of help, which is he a, had help, but it, he it, we, was definitely like the flag bearer at the, yeah. at, the at the front. It's it's yeah. It's it, these are never these are no, never solo missions. This all this always requires a lot of people, both yeah. both who are either on board or at least willing Listen, to look like, the other way, but. Sucks to be the guy left holding the flag. And every the... every Captain America has a Bucky, but he was still the Captain America of Killing Comics. Oh, <laughs> so and and I with that I'm going to I'm going to bid you all adieu, and I love will you, see sir. you. I love you guys. I will see you all a little later. Bye. I'll be back next week. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dallas we'll inferted. <laughs> love you guys. That's a joke. He didn't actually do that. <laughs> I'm gonna scoot over here so I can look at social. Okay. And now we're You're just so super... far away. Should I bring the social over here? here? I can, let me. That was not a real complaint. I mean, oh, I don't. Oh, do you want me to be far away? No, no, I just, it's not a thing you have to fix. <laughs> Actually, the cord is right here. I don't. I, okay, move I closer. Don't, can't, but the, will the cord let me? Answer? Should I move? No. We didn't have a plan. We, did, we didn't consider this part. Uh, Talison ruins everything. Yeah. I'm here to ruin things. The Great Ruiner. All right, Amy, keep talking while I I'm... want to convene a subcommittee on Taliesin's corrosive effect on... <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the audience at home, I love these two. All right. Uh, that's what he claims. So yeah, it is true, and you know it. Uh, Taliesin, I have to go, wait, wait, let me finish my book report. <laughs> so true. Uh, wait, 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 I've got a book report. Oh, Selena's uh, reframing us. You're the best. Am I, am I sitting up tall? Am I, is this good? All right. All right. Beep, bop, boop. By 1954, something like a dozen states have laws on the book restricting the sale of inappropriate comics and all kinds of verbiage that was probably likely yeah. to be struck down eventually on First and, Amendment grounds. Uh, but, uh, not only the, the states, but uh, some of the states that didn't, some of the cities did. Mm -hmm. Like Los Angeles, it was like, oh no. Apparently L.A. was super yeah. into banning comics. Yeah, L.A., like every single time it came around, like every single time there was a wave where they could cancel it, there was a, a new law put on the books. Like, oh no, d you can't put them in this kind of store. You can't do that. You can't sell this kind of thing. It's got to be over. Like it was hyper, hyper judicious. Is that the word judicious? Legal? I don't know. Whatever. It was hype. Lots of laws around comics in Los Angeles. Lots of uh, uh, legislative activity there. Uh, so... This was all going on. We had the, the Senate hearings to decided to devote two days to comics. Uh, oh. And poor Bill Gaines volunteered no. to testify. Uh, see, okay, see, this is why a movie Bless needs to be made heart. about Bill Gaines. He goes from, oh, I don't want to do this. My dad is making me do this. It's stupid. I'm just going to do it until it disappears. Wait, this is amazing. Wait. I want to do all of this, and I want to pay everyone fair wages. Oh, I want to be the biggest publisher in the world. You want to threaten what I love? I'm going to take you to court. Like, he's just like, He tried I to love him Smith so goes to Washington much. And, and it, he's super and it backfired, backfired so bad. Just amazingly. Uh, so the, the context for that was that, uh, like, he, he didn't have she, to go in. Come on. <laughs> I don't even know why he earned it that time. All I try to do is, uh, I see Chief all day, like while I work, I'm like, hey, I think you're great. I, I hope that you're having a good day. Hey, wh what do you need? Can I help you with anything? And then he puts flames around me. Tweet us your ideas for what Matt Key has done that uh, makes it totally <laughs> his fault. That, uh... Aw, oh, Chief, you just redeemed yourself. What a Chief. <laughs> uh, so... In the meantime, the, the other new thing that had happened at EC, mm -hmm. uh, which ended up just, wow, spectacularly bad timing for some of these. <laughs> you know who's the devil is those darn pesky humor magazine types. Oh, yes. You know what? I, I, I pulled uh, Panic. Good. Oh, well, okay. And this... Just, just throwing that out there. Yes. Uh, so what, what comes first is essentially that for, for internal business reasons, 
They want another book on another title on the stands. Harvey Kurtzman would like to do some more stuff. Uh, he is one of the most famous editors and humorists of all time, but sort of in a rush came up with this idea of like, what if we do just kind of like some jokes? Mm -hmm. uh, like a joke magazine, yeah. a, joke, a joke comic. Yeah, uh, tales calculated to drive you mad. <laughs> I just love that you have all this stuff in your head. We keep buying them at the store, like Vintage Mad, they're amazing. Really? Yeah, oh my gosh. Oh. Because for its first 23 issues, it was comic book size. Yeah. Like the rest of yeah. it looked like Tales from the Crypt or Halt yeah. of, uh, Halt of Fear, Halt. Haunt of, <laughs> Fear, Vault of Horror. Vault of Horror, it's Tales from the Crypt. By um, the way, the, the 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 book that I'm currently reading now, the uh, of Comics and Men, girl, uh, sick, right? When it, when you disagree, you're like sure. sick. Um, uh, it, it explains why comic books are sized the way they are, which I'd never known. It's because when you get like those giant sheets, you can fold it in certain ways. Oh yeah. And I never knew that before, so they're like, no, we uh, if we fold it this many ways, we can get 32 pages out of it. And it just so happens to be, you know, the size of the comic. What I didn't know, like, I know Golden Age was basically giant newspaper sheets folded into four. And then yeah. Silver Age got a little smaller, and I'm not exactly sure, like, what were the printing reasons yeah, that I, that happened. Yeah, I don't uh, either. But, like, I, I assume I, because it's comics, it was slightly cheaper. Probably so. <laughs> probably so. Yeah, but that was just a, another interesting thing that I found out. Yeah, in weird my thing studies. that we'll go to on a different episode is mm -hmm. when the DC nearly uh, folded because paper got expensive in the 70s. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> they that had to one raise yet. prices because of paper shortages during like uh, Nixon times. Uh, anyway, uh, it, it it was because Nixon was burning all the paper. Uh, I might have some. It's if, don't quote me on it being Nixon times in my head because it was the seventies. <laughs> I assume it's his fault somehow, um, but I haven't looked into. He wasn't even president all yet. Of the it's his fault. Uh, um, so sizes. Golden Age, Mad Magazine. Mad Magazine. Uh, is there a you comic go. book. Well done. And this is one of those things where, like, there are some things in these comics where you look at them now and you're like, I can see why that mm -hmm. worried you, parents mm -hmm. of 1952. Mm -hmm. And then there's other things where we're sort of like, hell yeah, 1952. Your kids needed the, like, yeah. to laugh at authority yeah. is not a bad thing. Yeah. What, but boy, uh, they didn't like it. I think I marked it in. Or maybe I didn't. That uh, uh, like I, I forgot to s to submit this to the Dropbox, but this picture. Oh yeah. Right. Like uh, I'll, I'll just show that real quick. Here, uh, uh, do we have a we have a camera for this, right? Just hold it up to your face. Hold it up to your face. Beep beep beep. Yeah. Uh, but this uh this, this was in. This was in a Mad Magazine. A Will Elder spread from the first issue uh, after Mad changed format, so Mad 24, essentially. Uh, yeah, this is the very first magazine. 24, something like that. And mm -hmm. this represented uh, Bill Gaines sort of like, fuck you, to So this is post-code, essentially. Yeah. It's thumbing their nose at everything. It's, it's uh, but so the, the one, and I'm glad you pulled it up, but... This, for complicated comic book reasons, Mad Magazine gets started, and EC also starts a knockoff of its own magazine at the same time, because comics. Because uh, comics. And it's called Panic. Uh, panic being like, it's a panic being a sort of 50s way for being like, what a gas. Uh, and also, <laughs> just, I assume, so what it a would guess. be historically ironic. Uh, when they got dragged in front of the Senate. Uh, I assume that's why they picked mm -hmm. the name. Mm -hmm. Because Panic Number 1 contained a, like, a vicious satire on Christmas. Yeah, I've, I, I, pulled, I pulled the first page of that, Chief. It, it should be Panic. Uh, the, 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 the cover and the, that, that one. Because that one got... Boy, they got in a lot of trouble. They got banned from Boston. Boston is actually famous for banning things. But this yeah. was... Huh, but this, yeah, so there's Panic. Uh, uh, and this was Al Feldstein, right? He was, Kurtzman yeah, was, was doing Mad. Kurtzman did Mad and Feldstein did this. Yeah, Night Before this, Christmas. So who illustrated this again? Because this was important. Uh, was this Will Elder going to Yeah, town? it's Will Elder. Will um, Elder. With his goofy imagination. You'll remember him from the bullpen shot as the guy making the goofiest face on the entire page. He was just basically like uh, a authority-defying comedy, just wanted to have fun and make people laugh and... and uh, this poem anything. slaughtered by Bull Elder. I just saw that. Yeah. Oh man. So that this is the the reason the animals are quiet. Obviously, they gave him the text of this poem uh, because in an upcoming episode of Mad, they uh, issue of Mad, they had him doing uh, Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, and they were like, "Oh, this is funny. He just does ironic illustrations 
Um, and so this actually beat that to the stands, but it came out around Christmas and took this sacred ritual uh, and uh, scandalized the heck out of everybody. Yeah, and they, the Senate subcommittee was very receptive to that. <laughs> they were like, wait, he did what to that classic untouchable story? I love like, that they were like, if there's something pagan about uh, messing with Santa Claus. Yeah, there, that's, yeah that, is, that is sanctimonious, sir. Uh, yeah, like it, it's so funny that that's what they, they got hung up on was that he messed with the night before Christmas. And the other thing was that uh, 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 Bill Gaines' father, Max Gaines, when he started Education Comics, and Mac, Bill was the one who changed it to Entertainment Comics, right? Or Entertaining Comics? I do not remember exactly when the name changed, but that sounds right to me. Because um, he was like, I want them to be entertaining, not educational. If they happen to be educational, great. I'll continue doing stories from the Bible, but it's not my goal. He didn't keep doing them. He just sold the old ones. Yeah, he just sold the old ones so that, again, he could get away from the parents who were like, you're doing nothing but smut. No, I'm not. Look, it's Bible. It's the Bible. See? Uh, uh, I just, I am so scatterbrained panic, right now. Panic, panic. Thank you. Uh, I, love, I just said panic to calm and center you. Yeah, panic. panic. Oh, panic, thank panic. you. Panic. Thank you. Thank you. Panic. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, they, they, Max Gaines created uh, an imprint called Tiny Talk Comics. Oh, right. And uh, Bill Gaines and Feldstein in an ironic gesture, put Tiny Tot Comics as the publisher for Panic, and they did it out of a sense of like, ha ha, wacky wacky, it's not really for Tiny Tots, but it's Tiny Tot Comics. And the Senate subcommittee was like, see, Tiny Tot Comics, you're saying this is for kids, and they're like, no, you're missing the joke, and they're like, it's not a joke to kids who see Tiny Tots and want to buy that comic because it's for them. It's like, oh my god. So missing the point was basically the subheading of yeah. a lot of these uh, hearings. Yeah. Like, the uh, artists and writers were just too smart I mean, they for their also, own good. Like, it's it, it's they fascinating own grade, to yeah. read these because they, they like, uh, I think, before we get into the, since we lost Allison, shall, mm -hmm. we, shall we look at a couple of excerpts from this? Let's do it. Bill Gaines. Let's do it. I uh, so, Bill Gaines volunteers to testify. He goes after Wortham. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, unfortunately, on this first day of hearings, is when they slide from, let's try to establish or, because they open, the inquiry opens with a basically a broad-minded, we're not taking anything for granted, we're here to look into comic books and see if they contribute to juvenile delinquency, because this is a committee mm -hmm. on juvenile delinquency. Uh, we want to be fair. Yeah, and in the course of that first day, they slide from that into the... Let's just assume we've already proven that they're damaging and then see if they're filthy. Because if they're damaging and filthy, then they clearly we need to do something about them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, let's see. And, and Bill Gaines is like, I'll stand and I'll, I'll go to fight for us, fellows. You want to be Gaines and I'll be everybody else? Yeah, do, uh, where's... Oh. I only printed one oh, copy okay. of these because it's way okay. too long. But sure. we'll, uh, we'll do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm Gaines and you're everyone else. Yep. Okay. So you have stayed up, just for context. You right. stayed up Important. all night writing. Stressed like, about you've this. been freaking out about yeah. this because you volunteered to go in and defend comics. Uh, this and you thing have that prepared, you love now. Mm -hmm. You prepared a statement. You may proceed in your own manner. I did not listen to it. There's an audio of this out there, but I couldn't find a working copy, so I'm making up the interpretations here. Gentlemen, I would like to make sh a short statement. I am here as an individual publisher. Will you give your name and address for the record? Mis uh, my name is William Gaines. My business is 225 Lafayette Street, New York City. I am a publisher of the Entertaining Comics Group. I'm a graduate of the School of Education in New York University. I have the qualifications to teach in secondary schools, high schools. What then am I doing before this committee? I am a comic book publisher. My group is known as EC Entertaining Comics. I am here as a voluntary witness. I asked for and was given this chance to be heard. Two decades ago, my late father was instrumental in starting the comic magazine industry. He edited the first few issues of the first modern comic magazine, Famous Funnies. My father was proud of the industry he helped found. He was bringing enjoyment to millions of people. The heritage he left is the vast comic book industry which employs thousands of writers, artists, engravers, and printers. It has weaned hundreds of thousands of children from pictures to the printed word. It has stirred their imagination, given them an outlet for the, their problems and frustrations, but most important, given them millions of hours of entertainment. My father before me was proud of the comics he published. My father saw in the comic book a vast field of visual education. 
he was a pioneer. Sometimes he was ahead of his time. He published picture stories from science, picture stories from world history, and picture stories from the American history. He published picture stories from the Bible. I would like to offer these in evidence. They will be received for the subcommittee's permanent files. Let that be exhibit number 11. I'm the chairman. <laughs> Since 1942, we have sold more than 5 million copies of picture stories from the Bible in the United States. He's fudging. Uh, they have been out of print for years, but they still have old stocks of them. But <laughs> here in <the> point stands. <laughs> uh, it is widely used by churches and schools to make religion more real and vivid. Picture stories from the Bible is published throughout the world in dozens of translations, but it is nothing more nor nothing less than a comic magazine. I publish comic magazines in addition to picture stories from the Bible. For example, I publish horror comics. I was the first publisher in these United States to publish horror comics. I am responsible. I started them. <laughs> some, some may not like them. That is a matter of personal taste. It would be just as difficult to explain the harmless thrill of a horror story to a Dr. Wortham as it would be to explain the sublimity of love to a frigid old maid. He said that to a Senate committee. Uh, and Wortham was there, right? Like, Wortham's like, had just hey, presented. Just, a, just wait a minute, mister. Uh, I, don't, I, I assume he was still there listening. Yeah. But, uh... Uh, my father was proud of the comics he published. I am proud of the comics I publish. We use the best writers, the finest artists. We spare nothing to make each magazine, each story, each page uh, a work of art. As evidence of this, I might point out that we have the highest sales in individual distribution. I don't mean the highest sales in comparison to comics uh, of another type. They I were mean, not the biggest company. I mean highest sales in comparison to other horror comics. The magazine is one of the few remaining... The comic magazine is one of the few remaining pleasures that a person may buy for a dime today. Pleasure is what we sell, entertainment, reading, enjoyment. Entertain, entertaining reading has never, been, has never harmed anyone. Men of goodwill, free men, should be very grateful for one sentence in the statement made by federal judge John M. Woolsey when he lifted the ban on Ulysses. Judge Woolsey said, It has got cut off, but it's, it is only with the normal person that the law is concerned. Keep going. Uh, we won't go too much further than this, but uh, essentially, this is the good stuff. This is the statement he came out in with, which, had he stopped here, might have been very effective. <laughs> May I repeat, he said, it is only with the normal person that the law is concerned. Our American children are, for the most part, normal children. They are bright children. But those who want to prohibit comic magazines see, seem to see dirty, sneaky, perverted monsters who use the comics as a blueprint for action. Perverted little monsters are few and far between. They don't read comics. Edit this next line. Uh, <laughs> the chances are most of them are in schools for mentally handicapped children. Read the 1954 version of that. Yep. What are we afraid of? Are we afraid of our own children? Do we forget that they are citizens too and are entitled to select what they read or do? We think our children, uh, we think our children are so evil, simple-minded that it takes a story of murder to set them to murder, a story of robbery to set them to robbery. Jimmy Walker once remarked that he never knew a girl to be ruined by a book. Nobody has ever been ruined by a comic. As has already been pointed out by previous testimony, a little healthy normal child has never been made worse for reading comic magazines. The basic personality of a child is established before he reaches the age of comic book reading. I don't believe anything that has ever been written can make a child over-aggressive or delinquent. He goes on to sort of say delinquency has other causes, uh, and essentially... To this, like, that he read this far, that he read this into the record, that he said, what are we so afraid of? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's pretty fantastic. Yeah, not only what are we so afraid of, but there seems to be, like, the, the evidence that Wortham has presented is refutable. Like, other psychologists have said, this, this doesn't count. And he was like, right. This there was not broad scientific consensus that, that, that kids were damaged by comics. There yeah. were a lot of folks saying, I'm not sure yet. Uh, that got read into the record as like, so you're kind of in the middle then. Yeah. They're like, yeah, yes, yeah, I guess. Yeah, it seems to be relatively inconclusive. <laughs> to, so much so that we shouldn't threaten an entire industry over this. Yeah, and he does, he quotes from an actual, a, a different conflicting doctor who basically says comic books do not lead into crime, although they've been widely blamed for it. Uh, and, and essentially, so they go back and forth a little bit. They get, enter that all into the record. And then he starts refuting specifics. And here's kind of where it goes wrong. He has said, essentially, that he'd stayed up all night. He was on weird pills for a diet. Uh -huh. Like, uh, he was crashing. His energy was falling. And he was probably nervous as heck. And also, I would say, it's probably terrifying. 
to talk to a Senate committee? Yeah, about your livelihood. <laughs> and that, like, like the Senate subcommittee seems to have already, in a lot of ways, made up their mind to follow with Wortham, especially because of Keefe offer. Uh, and like other, uh, like there was a TV episode where like they, what was it on CBS, I think, or something mm. like that, where it was a documentary on. Uh, confidential Files or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I think it was something uh, like that. There was a DVD of this that came attached to a reprint of a, a book, but I couldn't figure out if there was any sort of, I, probably not a fair use copy we could bring in on here. Yeah, but, but like it was. like a total 60 minute style scare like thing on the dangers of comics, complete yeah. with terrifying reenactments. And uh, the, the the thing that they pointed out in the in the book that I really loved was that everyone that they talked to in that show was like one on one with the host, but when it got to Kefauver, there was an American flag behind him, and he would turn and address the camera. Hello, <laughs> I'm talking to you now, the American public. Hello, comic books are evil and they're bad, right, host? Yes, they are. Like, so, uh, so they and they. So that's he the starts, environment that he's doing this. Gain in. starts in to rebut things, and he basically, basically he he catches essentially one of Wortham's kind of half truths, mm -hmm. where he's like, Fred Wortham had been like, the comic books are also making people racist because they have a bunch of stereotypes, mm -hmm. and while. That was probably true of some comics. Probably like, so. Uh, artistic legend Will Eisner, one of the, you've heard us talk about him, one of the all-time greats, has a very aged, poorly black sidekick character uh, mm -hmm. in his most famous strip of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of issues here. But uh, essentially, Wortham went after a story that didn't deserve it. He basically said, like, eh, there's this one comic where they're using uh, slurs for Mexicans and blah, 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 blah. And Gaines goes, that was my book. That's a story about the evils of racial prejudice. Yeah. Like, Wortham didn't even, and, and he, so it seems like he's scoring points, right? But yeah. the committee comes back at him and says, so you're saying comic books can affect people because you're trying to teach them good messages. Yeah. But you're denying that they can, teach that they them can bad give messages. them bad messages. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, well, it's different because in these stories, we try to do it this way, yeah. but like he's kind of losing it, right? And they get into... God, I'm so glad that you pulled this because I had forgotten this like part of the book and it's like, oh my God, you're right. It's, it's fascinating. All 14 pages of his testimony will not be read on the show, but are available online. Uh, and he, they get into, like he makes some great points, like kids don't need comics to find violence. It's in the newspapers, mm -hmm. it's in the movies, it's all over the place. Uh, but let's see. Essentially, like, don't fault us for the violence of the world that already exists apart from us. Like, yeah. So then he tries to defend, like, a twist ending story with a kid murderer, and they're like, so that was your O. Henry twist, is that murder's awesome? And he was like, no, no it's no, the kids it's... don't identify with, and he's kind of losing it. Yeah. Uh, because it is very difficult to explain. I, he really should have just defaulted back to the if you don't understand the harmless thrill of a horror story thing. Yeah. But, like, he's off his script now, and he's trying to improvise with them. Um, and then somebody basically, they end up pitting him, despite him being the worst example you could pick of someone only in it for the money, mm -hmm. they basically say like, so you're selling millions of these things and you're making a ton of money and you don't care what's in them, right? Uh, and he's saying, uh, let's see, let me get the limits as far as what you put into your magazine. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be everybody but games okay. again. Let me get the limits as far as what you put into your magazine. Is the sole test of what you would put into your magazine, whether it sells? Is there any limit you can think of that you would not put in a magazine because you thought a child should not see or read about it? No, I, I, I wouldn't say that there is any limit for the reason you outlined. My only limits are bounds of good taste, what I consider good taste. Then you think a child cannot in any way, in any way, shape or manner, be hurt by anything that a child reads or sees? I, I, no, I do not believe so. There would be no limit, actually, to what you put in the magazines. No, only within the bounds of good taste. Your own good taste and saleability. Yes. Kefauver jumps in, because I was Beezer just now. Mm -hmm. Here is your uh, May 22nd issue, and what he means is the May issue, which is issue number 22. Mm -hmm. People still can't read covers right. This seems to be a man with, uh, and if you could pop up Crime Suspense Stories 22, here's the picture they're about to see in these Senate hearings. Yeah, they actually show this in the Senate hearings. I am going to dramatically pause for this. And then I'm going to... Yeah! Yep. This seems to be a man with a bloody axe holding a woman's head up, which has been severed from her body. And he asks Gaines, under oath, do you think this is in good taste? Uh, yes, sir, I do, for the cover of a horror comic. So I'm going to pause right there because I think that is like 
we, we will we'll read the rest of this, but that is the crux of the dang thing. Mm -hmm. What he is trying to say is comics don't all need to be the same kind of story. They don't all need mm -mm. to be for the same audience. Different things are appropriate for different stories. But what he has actually just done is say, I consider that in good taste. Yeah, like to, to ears who are not ready to understand, like who aren't ready to understand what the medium even is. So here's the immediate, like he clarifies. Yeah, yes, sir, I, I do for the cover of a horror comic. A, a cover in bad taste, for example, might be defined as holding the head over, uh, head a little higher so that the neck could be seen, dripping blood from it and moving the body over a little further so that the neck of the body could be seen to be bloody. Senator Kerfover, you have blood coming out of her mouth. A, a, a little. Here is blood on the axe. I think most adults are shocked by that. The chairman says, here's another one I want to show him. And they bring up another issue and ask him whether that one's in good taste. Uh, it seems to be a man with a woman in a boat and he is choking her to death with a crowbar. Is that in good taste? Uh, I think so. A third guy, Mr. Hannock, goes, how could it be worse? And then Senator Hennings, who's uh, running things, says, Mr. Chairman, if counsel will bear with me, I don't think it is really the function of our committee to argue with this gentleman. I believe that he has given us about the sum and substance of his philosophy. Uh, so essentially, they, give, they ask him one final question, which is he's like, you claim you want to bring enjoyment, but you also want to make money, right? And he's like, well, yeah, both. And they're like, yeah, we're done here. Yep. Uh, they call the next uh, witnesses. Uh, and uh, they, they, it's basically, he has said the exact thing that needed saying, but he also stood next to a picture of a severed head, said this is in good taste. It was on every newspaper. Yep. And they were like, well, maniacs are running comics. I think they're right. Shut it down. Yep, shut it down. And Thank you for your gains there, by the thank way. Thank you for reading everyone else. <laughs> I did my best 1940s voice. <sighs> um, uh, yeah, Miss Sunflower. Man, if they did a movie uh, out of this, it would break my heart. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. Like, because he's not wrong. It's a horror comic. Bill Gaines was right. <laughs> <laughs> it is, a, but like their their brains were not ready. Like they had already made up their mind, and he just gave them the ammunition in the wrong way. Like what he was saying was right, and they caught him on it all the same. Yeah. And and every other comic book publisher was like, "What the fuck, man? <laughs> like you, you you were supposed to be the banner." The actual guys who were just in it for the money were like, "We didn't agree to testify. Are you insane? Why would we do that? Why would we do that? You just." You just sunk us all. I mean, granted, it was going to happen anyway. At this it point, was. the book was, was coming out. It was. Books, laws were on the books everywhere. If he had declined to testify, it is not clear that things would have been all that different. And uh, I have the actual wording of the committee here. The oh, decision. Lovely. Senate subcommittee. Um, uh, this is coming out, I think, in 1954. Uh, they concluded, quote, this country cannot afford the calculated risk involved in feeding its children through comic books a concentrated diet of crime, horror, and violence. Standard for such products, whether in the form of a code of by the policies of individual producers, should not be aimed to eliminate only that which can be proved beyond, uh, beyond doubt to demoralize youth. Rather, the aim should be to eliminate all materials that potentially exert detrimental effects. To achieve this end, it will, it will require continuing vigilance on the part of parents, publishers, and citizens groups. Essentially what they've just said is, okay, maybe we can't prove that they hurt kids. Doesn't matter. It still needs to be policed, whether that's by groups outside of the comics or an industry group. Hence, Bill Gaines in 1953 or, or September of 54. 54 year, yeah. yeah, September of 54. A few months after these hearings. Uh, an attempt to redeem himself with his comic book uh, uh, publishing brothers and sisters. Which is, again, a fairly small piece of just a very yeah. significant one. He's a, yeah, he's a very significant, but I, the, again, the, this other book that I'm going through right now said that they, EC at that time accounted for maybe 2 to 3% of the entire industry mm. in terms of sales uh, and, and distribution. So t super tiny. Uh, uh, but um, he calls together the very first meeting of the comic 
uh, Magazine Association of America. Not named that yet, yep. but he calls it together. What will become? And eight publishers show up, then 12, then almost all of them. And then the guy from Archie takes over. Uh, <laughs> literally what happened that's literally uh, what happens and uh, but there, so there we should mention there was an earlier uh yes there was an earlier trade association uh that had an earlier when the earlier panic they attempted to do a code which was sort of like we'll have decent stuff um i guess if, if are we reading the codes now because this is probably the time yeah, we yeah i think so okay. uh it's this is the uh from the 1948 is the comics magazine publishers or association so the acmp association of comics magazines publishers and, Ooh, and I will uh, uh, just insert, this is, of course, following in the footsteps of the motion picture Hayes Code and yes, a wave of other, uh, like, there, this was not the only industry facing these questions and resolving them by self-policing. Yeah, self-policing. Um, and this attempt was never really enforced, but this was their first attempt. Well, and not only that, like, uh, to add on to that, a footnote, if you will, uh, not a will, actually, a footnote, <laughs> um, is that uh, most publishers didn't even join this. Yeah. Um, so, uh, just a couple. Uh, first, crime should not be presented in such a way as to throw sympathy against law and justice or to inspire other with the desire for imitation. No comics shall show the details and methods of a crime committed by youth, policemen, judges, government officials, and respected institutions should not be portrayed as stupid or ineffective <laughs> or represented in such a way as to weaken respect for established authority. Take it up with the Keystone Cops, buddy. Yeah, right? Uh, number two, no scenes of sadistic torture should be shown. Number three, sexy wanton comics uh, uh, should not be published, just at all. Uh, no drawings should show female indecently uh, <laughs> or unduly exposed, and in no event more nude than in a bathing suit commonly worn in the United States. Four, vulgar and obscene language should never be used. Slang should be kept to a minimum and used only when essential to the story. Five, divorce should not be treated humorously nor represented as glamorous or alluring. Six, ridicule or attack on any religious or racial group is never permissible. And that's it. Which is, again, the mixed bag of, like, good advice, silly advice, weird advice. Yeah. Uh, you know, because the, the, that's a whole bundle of aims in one, like, pretty sure racism and, and slang represent different levels of threat to the youth of America. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, one brush for all offenses. One, yep. <laughs> Uh, uh, so then... But nobody paid attention to that, nobody was enforcing it, and not many people actually belonged to that organization. So it didn't do much to stem the tide of public opinion yeah. when this second and very intense Royal of Panic hit. More book burnings, more voluntary associations more declaring like, things, more, more laws on the books local everywhere. More state laws, more courts, like, ah, this is pretty bad, like local like and regional courts and stuff like that, yeah. Uh, and so... The, the Comics Magazine Association of America is formed, and in October, on October 26th, 1954, they adopt the following voluntary code of acceptable content for comics. Do you want to just, like, trade off every so often? Yeah, and I don't think, I don't think we read all of these. I think we kind of just, like, can pick and choose, because there's a lot. Well, it's, it's, it's 840. Oh, no! I was, in my head, I was like, we have a two-hour show. We can read the whole code. Yeah. Uh, but it turns out we need two hours to yeah, explain we, the code. We need two co and there's still a couple. And we of... haven't even gotten to the, like, fall. We need another part for the Yeah, we're going to have to have the, the fallout yep. episode. Okay. Yeah. Fallout episode? Yeah. Okay. Talison can't <laughs> stop us. We can make whatever decisions we want. Yeah, he's not here. He left. <laughs> uh, I, I, you go first. Uh, okay, let's see. This preamble is pretty straightforward. The comic book medium, having come of age on the American cultural scene, must measure up to its responsibilities. Sounds good, right? Mm -hmm. Constantly improving techniques and higher standards go hand in hand with these responsibilities. To make a positive contribution to contemporary life, the industry must seek new areas for developing sound, wholesome entertainment. The people responsible for writing, drawing, printing, publishing, and selling comic books have done a commendable job in the past and have been striving toward this goal. This is a uh, desperate attempt to change the tide of public opinion, uh -huh. which at this point, uh, as you heard from anecdotes earlier, was like, oh, I'd rather be a murderer than a comic book artist. Their record of progress and continuing improvement, blah, blah, blah. Uh, comics can be educational, they can be blah, blah, blah. The industry will and must continue to work together. Uh, 
Violations of the standards of good taste, which might tend toward corruption of the comic book as an instructive and wholesome form of entertainment, will be eliminated. Therefore, the Comics Magazine Association of America has adopted this code and placed strong powers of enforcement, that's what's different this time, in the hands of an independent code authority. Independent code authority. Hyper they important. Hired a guy, and he hired five ladies, and they read everything that was going to have this seal on it before they would give it mm -hmm. the seal. And uh, they read it after the inking stage. Yeah. And then they would like white out words that were not right. They would make notes on the art and be like, you've got to, like, she, uh, th this woman looks like too much of a witch. Just, you have to remove all of these, like, she has to look relatively normal because you can't have a horror. We should show anything. the one. Thank you yeah. for pointing that out. I should have loaded this in. This is one of their publicity shots, uh, the successful okay. effects of the code. Mine is probably not shiny, so I'm going to switch to my oh, crap paper. Mine's shiny. You're well, shiny. Because you have a beautiful hardcover. Um. Also, you were kind enough to give me this one, and I yeah, love it. It's a um, gift. Okay, so. Because I adore you. Whatever's the go. best place to put this. This is the, the code taking care of all your problems, because this guy has taken the scary witch lady and given her a mole. And, oh, much and more And less acceptable. wrinkles. They fixed it, guys. Her, her teeth aren't fangs. Kids will not be harmed by this basically normal looking lady. Uh, yeah, Char Charles F. Murphy. And by the way, uh, this is Bill Gaines. Uh, yeah. If you wanted to see what he looked like, it's a little Poor shiny. Poor guy. Yeah. Warp, warp. Oh, that's the still from him tearing up his own comics. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. what a heartbreak. Yep. What a okay. heartbreak. Um, so, 8.45, and we still have to do five I minutes know. in letters. Okay, crap. Uh, maybe we. Confident in the positive word, code for editorial matter. General standards, part A. Crime shall never be presented in such a way as to create sympathy for the criminal, to promote distrust of the forces of law and justice, or to inspire others with a desire to imitate criminals. I have to pause here because uh, never create sympathy for a criminal is basically a rule that says don't make your story interesting. Yep. Uh, number two, no comic shall explicitly present the unique details and methods of a crime. Number three, policemen, judges, government officials, and respected institutions shall never be presented in such a way as to create disrespect for established authority. That was... Uh, <coughs> that, 50s. Yeah, well, the 50s, yes. But I, if I remember correctly, uh, some of the stuff, even outside of this, um, that was one of the codes that Bill Gaines was like, Ooh. so, like, we're a fascist society now. Because <laughs> we can't, we can't, like, we can't look at this and be like, we can't, we but can't. you couldn't say that kind of thing in the 50s? I know, I know, but it's just like, oh, come on. Okay, number four. If crime is depicted, it shall be as a sordid and unpleasant activity. Criminals shall not be presented as so as to be rendered glamorous or to occupy a position which creates a desire for emulation. Six, this is a good one. Mm hmm take it. In every instance, good shall triumph over evil and the criminal be punished for his misdeeds. Number seven, scenes of excessive violence shall be prohibited. Scenes of brutal torture, excessive and unnecessary knife and gunplay, physical agony, gory, and gruesome crime shall be eliminated. Eight, don't hide weapons in interesting ways. I'm paraphrasing now. Yeah. Uh, Nine, I, don't have any law enforcement officers dying. That sounds scary. Uh, general standards, part C, profanity, obscenity, smug, Wait, vulgarity. No, 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 we can't oh, skip past uh, oh, this because oh, ten okay, is like kidnapping's it. no good. Number 11, this is great. The Comics Code of 1954. Yes. Uh, part A, subsection 11. The letters of the word crime on a comics magazine cover shall never be appreciably greater in dimension than the other words contained in the title. Can we bring that crime does not pay back on screen? The word crime shall never appear alone on a cover. And number 12, restraint in the use of the word crime in titles or subtitles shall be exercised. And then... This is so targeted! <laughs> yeah, and then this one is huge. Number 12, uh, well, wait, where, no, number, uh, General Standards Part B, uh, Section 1. No comic magazine shall use the word horror or terror in its title. And Bill Gaines, hearing that in their meeting, was like, all right, I'm out. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> because those were, were his two here. biggest sellers. And he, like, he was like, this is not what I intended for this committee. You guys have just screwed me out.
because those are my biggest sellers, and now I can't do that. So the next couple are basically scenes of horror and excessive bloodshed are no good, no depravity, lust, sadism, or masochism. Uh, all lurid, unsavory, gruesome illustrations shall be illustrated. I think it, it shall be eliminated. That's apparently why they cleaned up the witch lady. Uh, four, inclusion of stories dealing with evil shall be used or shall be published only where the intent is to illustrate a moral issue. In no case shall evil be presented alluringly, so as to, nor so as to injure the sensibilities of the reader. I love and the number bizarre five. number five. Uh, scenes dealing with or instruments associated with Walking Dead, torture, vampires, vampirism, ghouls, cannibalism, and werewolfism are prohibited. That is spelled W E R E W O L F I S M. Wolf. Werewolfism. 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 That common scourge of children everywhere. Yeah. Uh, all right, I, I, th I think we, I, I, I really, I hate to do that, but it's 848. Okay, but we're going to have to come back to this because we didn't get to marriage and sex or costume or religion or religion or slang. Or, yep, there's so much to cover. Oh, my yep. God, there's so much to cover. All right, so here's one thing that I want to say, uh, before, uh, if I may, uh, take yep. it for a half second. Uh, there is uh, an image, Chief, and you may, uh, it is uh, in memoriam, I believe, um, where is, I think I've got it highlighted here. Um, I, I, have it, I have it pulled up there. When um, he, so Bill Gaines has a press conference. Oh, yeah. He tries to come back, and it does not work out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he, he publishes this in, in his magazines as a in memoriam for what, what they could have done uh, or what they were. Uh, hold it right there. I love this middle. This is such a fuck you. <laughs> Naturally, with comic magazine censorship now a fact, we at EC look forward to an immediate drop in the crime and juvenile delinquency rate of the United States. We trust there will be fewer robberies, fewer murders, and fewer rapes. Exclamation point. And that's, that's all. That's all. I just wanted to point, like, I love that Bill Gaines even like he's lost, he can't publish what he wants anymore. He's got to change. He has, all of his associates just screwed him out. And interestingly, the company, uh, the company crashed. Mm -hmm. uh, the books got canceled. Uh, there was one thing that survived, and it was probably more dangerous than anything oh, else they were publishing. Way more dangerous. <laughs> Mad. Mad co could not escape the comics code, so it became a magazine. Uh, it changed formats, landed on newsstands in a different direction, they made it up as they went along, and it taught an entire generation of kids to completely thumb their nose at authority, uh -huh. Uh, uh -huh. gave a home to a, a ton of amazing artists, and set off in many ways, like contributed to the counterculture that would then go on to rewrite the 60s. Yeah. Oh my god, I love the code history so much. Uh, so, 10 minutes left. Yep. Topic from Board to Seth 87. What do you think comics would be like today had the code never existed? <sighs> Big topic, we've got five minutes. All right, go ahead and put five minutes on the talk and start, uh, clock, start counting down, and I'll introduce us, I guess, again. Am I doing that right? I never, Whatever. I feel like I never do this right. Whose topic was this? This is from Board to Seth 87. Thank you, Board to Seth 87. Board to Seth 87. All right, five minutes on the clock. I'm so ready. I'm so excited for this. Thank you for putting this episode together. No, oh, thank you for all your contributions. This is really fun to talk about. Please hit us up with all your questions. And we. All right. Oh, okay. We'll just keep talking then. Uh, uh, well, and, and does this mean I can read all the love and sex restrictions? Because I'm yeah, very excited. Do it, do it. Um, I mean, as many as we can confirm. Oh, wait, do we have, uh, oh, we don't have mail, because tell us and how to leave. That's right. Uh, we did, by the way. We're going to save letters columns. There's some great stuff for next week. Uh, there will be a lot, because we didn't get to do any of it tonight. Because tell us and how to leave, because uh, uh, he's a jerk. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, but we'll, we'll cover it next oh, week. Oh, they started the time. Here we go, okay. Okay. What would comics have been like without the code was our challenge from Board to Seth 87. Uh, we have five minutes to we answer five this minutes, just enormous, the two of us. insane question. Okay. If American comics had not been fundamentally changed. Uh, well, and American comics was setting a lot of the standards for European comics in a lot of ways. At least for Britain. At least for Europe Britain. Europe was kind of off and running. Europe was off and running, but like, not, anyway, not the topic. Not the topic. Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, I don't think we would have 
like superheroes would be just for kids. It was seen as kids. It wouldn't like, be the dominant genre of comics. They would be would, one no. thing if they were still being done. I, I, I think that at the time, a lot of, it was very much chasing fads. I think uh, eventually, like, uh, a lot of the, the larger companies like DC still would have absorbed Fawcett, still would have absorbed, uh, you know, these other places. Well, Dell still probably would have. out of existence, but that's a different story. Sure, sorry. Like, <laughs> uh, don't have my corporate stuff down. But, like, they would have absorbed, others would have disappeared, Dell would have maybe stayed in business and continued doing their thing. But it would have been a constant changing of genre so that today we would have this broad scope of genres in a, in a medium that barely anyone pays attention to. Oh, and a lot of the stuff that we got would have just arrived sooner. Like, their yeah. graphic novels were on their way, but they suffered a major setback oh, because so the market good. didn't that's, exist. Uh, other genres... Is, like, uh, they, they, all this stuff was brewing, but they, they didn't have a chance to get there. Now, the, that means that the major creative energies of a generation of talent got bent towards superheroes in the 60s, mm -hmm. and they created stories and characters that we adore and that have incredible richness and incredible life. And, are and it forced brilliant. comics to develop subtext in a lot of ways because you couldn't be as direct about things. So yeah. You had to get a little more creative with like, implication. Like the, the Nick Fury agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., like uh, Steranko. The uh, comics code forced him to uh, not show what he had planned. They couldn't have a phone off the hook uh, or a direct, like, an embrace that they had planned yeah. to show. So you essentially get a shot of a gun going into a holster. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you get, oh, like, that's... this really, like, this strangely subtly sexy, like, kind of, like, sequence of panels where it's like, oh, I know what's going on here. Ooh. Like, yep. so it wasn't that, like, they didn't do it. The code was like, don't do that. And they were like, well, we're going to. It's the story. We have to do it. We'll just find clever ways to communicate But that. part of the yeah. answer to our question lies in the fact that when eventually alternatives to the code existed, when the direct market came up and uh, you could get around it in various ways, immediately the other genres and other types of storytelling started to creep back in. Yeah. We just would have gotten it maybe earlier and maybe on the mass market, and that might have potentially led to a Japan-style diversity of subject matter Which and have, audience. Oh, God, that would be amazing. Uh, it, it also, in, this, in the late 60s, uh, adult comics started uh, becoming a thing, but that was because they could do direct mail kinds of stuff, and they had head shops that they could send them to. Kids weren't going to head shops, uh, so you could very safely put that stuff in there, too. So, like, adult comics started to exist back in the 60s, but not to the degree that the DC or Marvel were doing their thing. But it's difficult to speculate how much of underground comics depended on the specific communities that they landed in. Yeah. We don't know that that creativity would have played out in the same way under yeah. other circumstances. We don't know that we wouldn't have lost other things. Uh, and we also, if they hadn't adopted the code, we don't know whether comic books would have just been literally illegal. <laughs> or, or, yeah, they may have been completely illegal, or they, they may have just been allowed to flounder like it's entirely possible just a fad that goes away again just a fad that goes that comes and goes and never becomes a thing it's entirely possible that comic books would have eventually just kind of died out it seems unlikely that, it seems unlikely but it would it it's easy to imagine that they might have taken a different path if well, they had just kids gotten bored of because them instead the of becoming... trend was going down like comics were selling less and less every month distribution numbers were going down well that was mostly because of the moral panic but it could have ended True. up being kids just growing up and moving on yeah sure and like then like the the baby boomers come along and are like what's this stuff this is awesome like the flash is doing this now and and who are these Fantastic Four kids? And Spider-Man's doing what? Boom, the Silver Age. And the, because they survived a scare like this, the people who stuck with it were very dedicated. Uh, and the fan communities that emerged in the rebirth of comics post-code mm -hmm. were uh, very fierce. They started to appreciate artists because some of them had been taken away. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, it like it walked down that road. But, you know, we probably could have appreciated good art and not traumatized a generation not of Not traumatized creators. a generation of pop artists, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's difficult to say what would have happened, uh, but... Uh, I guess we kind of speculated all over the we place. We have five seconds to uh -huh. decide. Anyway, this has been the Wednesday Club. Uh, we're on Geek and Sundry's Twitch channel and on uh, Alpha every single Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, Pacific, uh, Pacific whatever. Pacific standard time. That's my key. I'm Amy Dallin, and Bill Gaines was right. Bill Gaines was right. Thanks for watching. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, how much? Do, we got two minutes. All right. Uh, I'm uh, reading two minutes of restriction on romance. I know we have other <laughs> business. Uh, uh, why do we talking about oh i know what we're talking about next week you want to tell them
Uh, do you want to read a couple of things from romance and then I'll tell them? Okay. We got two minutes. Restrictions Go. on marriage and sex. Divorce shall not be treated humorously nor represented as desirable. Illicit sex relations are neither to be hinted at nor portrayed. Uh, at violent love scenes as well as sexual abnormalities are ex unacceptable. That is a wide range, guys. <laughs> uh, three, respect for parents, the moral code, and for honorable behavior shall be fostered. A sympathetic understanding of the problems of love is not a license for morbid distortion. <laughs> Four, the treatment of live romance stories shall emphasize the value of the home and the sanctity of marriage. Five, passion or romantic interest shall never be treated in such a way as to stimulate the lower and baser emotions. Nothing sexy. Uh, I wish Whitney Moore were still here to appreciate this restriction. Uh, and then six and seven are sad ones. Six is no seduction and rape, and seven is basically no gay people. Thanks, 50s. Thanks, 50s. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that's been the best that we can <laughs> do to cram, like, the comics code into an hour, hour and 40 minutes. Um, parting thoughts, because we have a minute left? Uh, stay tuned for tonight, because we have the Minds and Crafts finale. Oh. And we can finally announce what's going to follow it. That's right. I'm so excited for this. Uh, do it. Say it. So starting, what? Yeah, starting next week, uh, we are going to be playing Weave, uh, the wonderful storytelling game that you guys saw previewed on AXYB last fall. Uh, and the ladies of Minds and Crafts and the ladies of AXYB are basically joining up for that. Uh, so you will get to hang out with all of us on Wednesday nights. Uh, and I'm the first storyteller. I heard. I'm, I'm excited. I'm on my first on-stream game. I'm not nervous. It's fine. <laughs> Flames all around. Yep. It's fine. Give me the devil horns in the flames it's now. It's fine. Um, yeah, so that's uh, uh, very exciting to me. And uh, next week on our uh, lovely little show, we will be talking about Black Panther. Uh, history of Black Panther, best comic, or our favorite comics to read, uh, controversy, this, that, whatever. Black Panther to get you prepped for the movie. Wakanda that is forever! Amazing. Uh, yeah, Wakanda forever! Uh, and uh, tell us that Jaffe was here. He's at Executive Goth if you want to yell at him on Twitter for leaving. Uh, I'm Matt Key at the Matt Key. Don't yell at Taliesin. Yell at me, enthusiavy. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next week on the Wednesday Club. Beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop, 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 boop,